Hello, son and daughter. This week we hit 28,000 subscribers. So I really want to thank you for supporting the work I do here. Tonight we're gathering around this here campfire to swap stories about restless spirits, alien run-ins, and maybe even a close encounter or two with old Sasquatch himself. So crack open a cold one and settle in. These stories will give y'all a hankering for the safety of daylight. In my early days, I was a hunter, one with a deep connection to nature's rhythms. The thrill of the hunt, the camaraderie shared with fellow hunters, the encounters with majestic creatures, all of these were integral parts of my life. I knew the forest like the back of my hand, and my rifle was an extension of myself. I was part of a tradition that spanned generations, a tradition that revered the art of tracking and the thrill of the chase. Yet, as the years went by, I began to witness changes in the world around me. Climate change brought erratic weather patterns, habitat loss accelerated, and the populations of the creatures I once pursued dwindled. I couldn't ignore the signs of a shifting environment, nor the responsibility that seemed to weigh heavier on my shoulders with each passing day. It was during a hunting trip deep in the heart of the wilderness that my perspective began to shift. I had ventured far from civilization, seeking solace in the familiarity of the forest. It was there that I encountered a rare and endangered creature, a glimpse of which seemed like a miracle. Its fur gleamed in the dappled sunlight, and its eyes held a wisdom that belied its vulnerability. In that moment, something within me stirred, a realization that the balance of the natural world was at a critical juncture. My encounter with this magnificent creature triggered a cascade of thoughts. As I gazed into its eyes, I felt a connection that transcended the boundaries of predator and prey. It wasn't just about the ethics of hunting anymore. It was about the larger implications of our actions on the delicate tapestry of life. This encounter marked the beginning of a transformative journey. I knew I couldn't continue as I had before, blind to the consequences of my pursuits. Driven by a desire to make a positive impact, I decided to shift my focus toward conservation efforts. I immersed myself in collaboration with local wildlife experts, researchers, and conservation organizations. Together, we endeavored to understand the challenges facing endangered species, to protect their habitats, and to combat the pervasive threat of poaching. The transition wasn't without its struggles. I faced resistance from my former hunting peers who saw my change in direction as a betrayal of tradition. Skeptics questioned my sincerity, believing my newfound advocacy to be a mere phase. Internally, I grappled with a sense of identity crisis. Who was I now if not the hunter who had roamed these woods for years? But as I ventured deeper into the world of conservation, I began to find my place. I realized that the intricacies of ecosystems were far more fascinating and interconnected than I had ever imagined. The delicate balance required to maintain them was a puzzle that challenged my intellect and my spirit. The joy of witnessing successful conservation efforts, even the smallest victories, ignited a fire within me that I hadn't felt in years. The pivotal moment came during a late-night stakeout in a remote part of the forest. We were monitoring a region known for its endangered species when an eerie stillness settled over the woods. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I felt a presence, a primal sensation that sent a shiver down my spine. And then I saw it, a figure, towering and powerful, standing on two legs like a colossal being from legend. It was Bigfoot, a creature that had eluded scientific explanation for generations. My heart raced, not just from fear, but from a profound sense of awe. The moment was surreal, a testament to the mysteries that still thrived within the wilderness. As Bigfoot disappeared into the night, I knew that my journey had come full circle. The hunter in me had transformed into a guardian, a protector of the delicate balance that sustained life. I had found a new purpose, one that extended beyond the thrill of the hunt. The realization struck me with a force that shook my very being. 
My role as a conservation advocate was far more impactful than my past identity as a hunter. And so, under the starlit sky, I pledged to continue my mission, to stand between the creatures I once pursued and the threats that sought to erase them. As I walked away from that night's encounter, a sense of gratitude and determination coursed through me. The wilderness had shaped me once as a hunter, and now it was shaping me anew as a protector of its mysteries. I am Sergeant Marcus, a National Guard agent specializing in biochemical threats. When the call came in about a remote research facility in Montana that had gone dark, I was dispatched to investigate. I remember feeling a strange sense of apprehension as we boarded the chopper, the usual humdrum, replaced by a tense silence. None of us had a clue about what we were walking into. The facility was located in a desolate part of Nevada, a bip of concrete and steel in the midst of arid nothingness. We landed just as the sun began to set, bathing the facility in an eerie foreboding glow. We made our way in, weapons drawn, nerves on edge. The silence was deafening. The complex was a labyrinth of corridors and rooms, all eerily deserted. It was as if the facility's staff had vanished into thin air. We made our way to the central lab, where we found the cause of the radio silence. The room was in complete disarray, papers scattered, lab equipment overturned, and at its center a swirling vortex of energy that pulsed with a sickly light. It was a portal unlike anything I'd ever seen. A low growl echoed through the room, and a creature unlike any I'd ever seen emerged from the portal. It was grotesque, its form defying the laws of nature. Its eyes glowed a malevolent red, and saliva dripped from its gnarled, sharp-toothed mouth. It roared, a sound that shook the very foundations of the facility, and charged at us. We opened fire, bullets tearing into the creature, but it seemed unfazed. More creatures followed, each more horrifying than the last. The facility became a battlefield, the air filled with the sounds of gunfire and the roars of the monstrous beings. But we held our ground, fighting tooth and nail against an enemy we barely understood. In the midst of the chaos, our tech specialist, Private Thompson, worked feverishly to reverse, engineer the portal. Sweat poured down his face as he manipulated the alien tech, trying to find a way to close the portal. I covered him, bullets flying from my weapon, each shot taking down a creature. Time seemed to stretch, each second an eternity. Finally, Thompson shouted, I've got it. He hit a button, and the portal began to shrink. The creatures roared in defiance, their hideous faces twisted in rage. But it was too late. The portal collapsed in on itself, leaving nothing but the cold, harsh, fluorescent lights of the lab. We were battered and bruised, but alive. The creatures were gone. The portal closed. The facility was silent once more, but the memory of those creatures of the portal was seared into my mind, a constant reminder of the unknown threats that lurk in the shadows. I am Sergeant Marcus, a National Guard agent. I defended humanity against the threat from another dimension, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. I serve as a park ranger at a park that seems to have far more playground than actual park. This means there's tons of child traffic most days, but of course my most days. This was back in the year of 2018, long before any crazy pandemic of any virus. There was even more on the weekends and on days that school was out. I'm older now, so my kids are grown and gone. So I enjoy my job when I got to see kids nearly every day. They didn't really seem to notice me, though. I just kind of blended into the background, which is why it caught my attention one day when on a very busy weekend, there was a little girl at the far end of the park that was smiling and waving at me. I looked around to make sure she wasn't waving to a friend or a parent or something, but no, she was looking straight at me and waving. I smiled and went back kind of chuckling to myself since most of these kids don't pay me any mind. 
My mood seemed lighter for the rest of the day after that. The following day, which was Sunday, there was just as much of a population of kids at the playground. They were all scattered about, and I remember, to my surprise, there was that same little girl that had waved at me the day prior. She waved and smiled just as enthusiastically. My heart melted, and I waved back. After all the stuff I saw in various areas of law enforcement spanned over the years, things like that restored my faith in humanity. I got two days off and came back on a Wednesday, making my rounds as usual. There were some kids, just not as many, a very common feat during the weekend and weekday. But I came back to that one playground, and there was that still that same little girl smiling. She was always wearing that same outfit, and she was standing in the exact same spot. That's when I began to feel differently, and even felt an open pit in my stomach. So I smiled and waved back to her when I noticed that she never stopped smiling or waving. The only thing that seemed to have changed is that she was smiling bigger than the very first time that I saw her, and maybe she seemed more thin. She was near back to a cluster of bushes that seemed to be right next to the general area, but were actually a bit further back. I decided to approach her to see what the real issue was, and as I did, I was hit with a horrifying odor, the stench of death and rotting flesh. There's a rope that was tied around her neck and her left arm in such a way that she would stand upright and have her arm raised slightly when the bush swayed in the breeze. She looked like she was waving. Without getting into any gruesome details, she had been horribly mutilated to show that she was smiling and waving again. Since I dealt with children, this made me disgusted. I got very dizzy and I had to sit down. How was I the only one who had seen her since Saturday? I immediately called out and filed a report. Even my superiors thought my story was strange and even suspicious, because they too wondered how I was the only one who had seen her. I wish I had a better explanation, and I feel like there were two deaths during the whole situation, hers and my faith in people. I walked about a mile from home to go mushroom hunting in a usual area, walked through a field of goldenrod as high as my shoulders, and was about to enter the woods when I felt something strange. I felt like I needed to go or I wouldn't get out of there alive. I didn't hear or see anything, but I had got goosebumps and I felt anxious when everything was fine before I reached that spot. I stood there debating and decided to go hunt somewhere else. I've gone back many times and haven't experienced that again. I live in an area that have bears, wolves, coyotes, and bobcats. I've never had any problems with them on walks or hikes in the woods, but maybe that day would have been different. Or maybe there was a bad person in there. I've learned to trust this feeling I get. It saved me many times. And when I ignored it, I got hurt. Whatever was in there, I did the right thing and not going in. It was the end of August, a perfect time for a vacation, and I, Donald, had decided to indulge my hobby of prospecting for gold. So there I was on the Chetco River, about 18 miles northeast of Brookings, hoping to strike it rich. And guess what? I found a vein. But that's not the story I want to tell you. What happened next was far more exciting and much more terrifying. After a day of exploring the area, driving the dirt roads in my trusty old Jeep, I decided to take a break. I parked the Jeep by the road to let the engine cool. The very dry and steep slope lined with thick brush just a few feet away. Visibility into the undergrowth was no more than 15 feet, but it was peaceful, serene. Then, without warning, the tranquility was shattered. Something charged at me through the brush. I couldn't see what it was, but I could hear it, a rustling sound that grew louder and closer. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. Whatever it was, it was lurking in the brush. About thirty-five feet away, I could hear it moving, but I couldn't see it. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I felt a cold rush of adrenaline. Thoughts raced through my mind. Was it a bear? An elk? Or something else? I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. 
I needed to protect myself. I rushed to the trunk of my Jeep and pulled out my magnum gun. I'm ready for you, I muttered, trying to sound braver than I felt. But nothing happened. Whatever it was, it didn't come any closer. The confrontation, if you can call it that, lasted about three to four minutes. But it felt like an eternity. Shaken by the experience, I decided to consult a local park ranger. A friend had introduced me to Ranger Ben, a grizzled veteran who knew the area like the back of his hand. We discussed the possibility of another animal, bear, elk, or even a cougar. But Ben wasn't so sure. You know, he said, leaning back in his chair, there are stories around these parts. Stories about a creature living deep in the woods. Some call it Bigfoot. I scoffed at the idea. But deep down, the unease lingered. Was it possible? Had I had a confrontation with Bigfoot? I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, that vacation was one I'll never forget. This incident happened back in 1995 when I was 15 years old. It was very horrible. I witnessed two guys that may have been like government agents or some other secretive governmental agents. They kidnapped my dad and left someone in his place that looked just like him. I later found out that the person left behind was a reptilian cloaked as a human. This person became rather rude to me as time went on. However, he talked with me and he could even heal with his bare hands. He told me that we humans were looked down upon as sheep, etc. And he knew I had witnessed the two agents kidnapping my dad, and he said I was next. I became very scared. He had me taken to a place against my will and met with what looked like a special forces group who forced me to sign paperwork against my will, and the guy who looked identical to my dad was standing there. I was spying on him one night and saw what looked like a snake's tongue come out of his mouth. I later discovered he was a reptilian. A very short human who looked like a midget was helping him. I think he was a gray cloaked human. I heard them talk in English, but then started talking in alien lingo, which sounded kind of far eastern. Yes, I am here to tell you they can cloak and simulate our world undercover. My real dad, the one I saw whisked away, was retired military, and I often suspected him of doing something or being involved with the government or doing something secretive that may have led to all this happening to me. I also found implants that feel like something under my skin. One was an upside-down triangle or diamond shape. They also stabbed me and then heated me with their eyes, which left a very weird scar on my leg. I never told anyone as I was so scared of how these entities seemed to be able to operate with impunity and like nothing could stop them. They also conducted very horrible activities and what seemed like mental brainwashing experiments on me. After all these years, I'm still scared to this day. But I believe it was time to come forward. I just wonder what happened to my real dad. My family and I had decided to take a trip to New Orleans, the city of jazz, voodoo, and legends. We checked into an old, historic hotel in the heart of the city, excited to experience the unique atmosphere that surrounded us. One night, after a day of exploring the city, my dad and I settled into bed, the room enveloped in darkness. The only light seeping in was from the lampposts outside, casting eerie, dancing shadows on the walls. My dad was already sound asleep, his steady breathing a comforting presence in the room. I lay facing his back, my thoughts meandering through the events of the day. Restless, I rolled over to face the other side of the room. That's when I saw it, a shadowy figure of a man wearing a hat and a long coat, clutching a briefcase. I strained my eyes, but his face remained indiscernible, as if he were an outline or a shadow rather than a physical presence. He just stood there, still and silent, an eerie sentinel in the dark. Panic surged through me, and I wondered if I was experiencing sleep paralysis. But as I shifted my body, blinked my eyes, I realized I could still move. My heart raced, my mind grasping for an explanation. Was it a trick of the light? 
a figment of my imagination? The figure remained, an unwelcome intruder in the room. I never experienced anything like that again, but the memory of that night in New Orleans has lingered, a chilling reminder of the unknown. I have shared my story, curious to know if others have encountered something similar. What was it that I saw that night? A specter from the past, or just a figment of my imagination? The answer remains shrouded in mystery. The day after my girlfriend and I saw the Mothman prophecies in the movie theater, we found ourselves driving up a road situated in the middle of Jefferson City, Missouri. The movie was still fresh in our minds, and we couldn't help but feel a bit on edge. As we made our way up the big hill on Southwest Boulevard, an unexpected event took place. Out of nowhere, a bird-like creature that bore an uncanny resemblance to the one from the movie suddenly bounced off my windshield. The impact startled both of us, and I remember thinking that I had never seen anything quite like it before. Right when the creature hit my windshield, my girlfriend cried out, Ho! Oh. The first thing that crossed my mind was how much it reminded me of the bird-like thing from the movie. Just as I was thinking that, my girlfriend said that looked like the thing in the Mothman prophecies. Though it wasn't the seven-foot humanoid creature with red eyes and wings that the movie depicted, it still left us feeling uneasy. I couldn't bring myself to look back and see what happened to whatever it was that hit the windshield, nor did I have the nerve to stop and investigate. Maybe I was too freaked out, or perhaps I was worried about what I might find. To this day, I still wonder about the peculiar sighting in Jefferson City, Missouri. Whether it was a mere coincidence or something more inexplicable, the experience remains etched in my memory, serving as a reminder that there are still mysteries in this world that defy explanation. So this guy had been abused as a child by his uncle. When he started talking about him sober, his face would scrunch up. He would talk through his teeth like hissing, like spitting as he talked. He would only do this sober. When he was high, he didn't care anymore. That was the point of the drugs. One night we were having a hard time getting drugs. We hadn't had any since the day before, so quite sober for the two of us. This is a guy who threw me through a closet door just a few weeks prior. He was violent, yelled. Name called, he hurt me a few times pretty good. But I was really messed up back then. It had already gotten to the point where I knew the end was near. It was time for me to get my life together and certainly time for me to get away from that a hole. I was standing on the edge of the cliff, just about to jump. Then that night, when he realized no one had any dope and he wasn't going to get any, he started talking about his uncle. We were sitting in the bed, facing the TV at the foot of the bed, so I was turning my head to the right, looking at him as he talked. It started calm and quickly escalated into the spitting, angry talk. He started hitting the bed in front of him with his fist as he raged, and I was terrified to look at him. I stared forward for what seemed like forever. Then, for whatever reason, I turned to look at him, and I saw exactly as you described. It was like a face over a face, or a face behind a face, and it wasn't human, and it wasn't good. I can't put into words the terror. It consumed my whole body. I've never felt that level of fear, and I hope I'd never do again. I jumped up from that bed and ran. I had a bicycle sitting outside on the porch. I grabbed that friggin' bike and mounted it in the front yard and pedaled into the street. I could hear him busting through the front door and his footsteps as he started running after me. He yelled at me, I swear to God I'm going to beat the F out of you when I catch you. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And he growled as he ran after me. There was that moment when I didn't have the bike going fast yet and was still accelerating and he almost caught up. Then I reached speed and left him behind. I was praying that my bike chain held on. It liked to fall off if I tried to accelerate too fast. Somehow it didn't fail me. I made arrangements for inpatient rehab that weekend. They had a bed open up the following Monday and I've been sober ever since. That was May of 2006. I've told the devil face story many times since then. I know what I saw. 
It was pure evil. I don't need any more convincing that evil can possess people. He definitely was. I probably was, too. The devil loves chaos and despair, fear, anger, violence. You get the picture. I choose today to distance myself from anything that resembles any of that. Thanks for the reminder. I haven't thought about him for a while. I need to be reminded. The devil is real, and I have a choice where I want to go. If I follow the rules, I get the good stuff, and if I don't, well, I've seen a glimpse of it, and no thank you. I decided to try a creek in the Cohutas, North Georgia, where three creeks merged at around 2,600, hoping to catch trout or one of the local bass species. After driving to the location, spending quite a bit of time on dirt roads to get to there, it is very clear based on the overgrown parking lot and lack of trash or other signs of humans that this was not a frequently used trail. At the start of the trip, that's exactly what I was hoping for. As I begin to head down the trail, it becomes pretty clear the descent is much steeper than I expected from Google Maps. After descending roughly 800 over the stretch of a half mile, I'm already nearing what I think is the end of trout water. But as I mentioned earlier, they have black bass species that live only in this area to target as well. The trail is completely flattened out and parallels the river, which has several creeks feeding into from higher elevations, giving me hope the water will be cold enough. For the first two miles, the creek is too narrow and shallow for me to even consider trying to fish it. As I make it further in, eventually enough creeks have merged that the water is consistently at least six inches deep, with little pools maybe a foot deep stream is about six, ten feet wide. Once I reached this point, I began to fish the creek anywhere I could feasibly bushwhack to the bank. There weren't many spots I was able to do this. The whole time I'm hiking and fishing, I'm keeping an eye out for any tracks or signs of bear activity, still a little on edge from running into a few the week prior and knowing that the next person to come along won't just be ten minutes away like last week. Around the five-mile mark, I see my first sign that anything else has ever been out there. It's a track three feet long, four fingers, two pads on the heel, no claws. Another fifty feet, another track, fifty feet past that I come up to a two-feet-tall game trail that appears to lead to a bedding area for something. I'd assume the track belonged to a bobcat or coyote. No claws makes me think cat, but I'd think it was on the big side for a bobcat. At this point, I hadn't had a bite and decided to head back to the truck. I reach the bottom of the hill to climb back the last stretch. I see a bad sign. The third set of tracks. I see all day that are not mine or the ones I previously described belong to a bear. Two tracks. Several trees in the area have also had pieces of bark ripped off. Saplings were ripped up. Now all of the missing bark was facing downhill, so I convinced myself I just wasn't able to see it earlier, and I must have missed the tracks. This is about all I can come up with since that trail up is the only way out. Not even five steps into my ascent, I found the bear. As I was ninety degrees with a bush to my left, it roared, and at least in my head, the entire bush shook when he did. I was close enough to touch the bush with my left arm. Unlike previous bear encounters at distance, where I was able to calmly stand my ground and then back off when that didn't work, I completely panicked. My first reaction was to turn my back to the bear and run before realizing what I was doing. As soon as I caught myself, I tuned back towards it, stood tall, arms out, and trying to talk as normally as possible as I retreated back 100 feet. As I'm standing here, I quickly realize I'm at a low spot on all four sides with zero visibility forward, backwards, or to my left, two of the three directions I'd assume the bear would come from, if it were to advance on me. Moving to my right by about 30 feet puts me on slightly higher ground, but also takes me off the trail and most likely further reduces my visibility. I decide standing right where I was while everything cooled down was not any better or worse than anything else I could do. After waiting 30 minutes on my watch after the initial bear encounter, I have not heard the bear in a while. 
I decide to test with a rock throw in its direction since I'm getting pretty tired of the calling. The bear very loudly lets me know it is still there. I remember how remote the area is and that I did not see a single track or sign showing human life had ever been on the five miles I walked. Another 30 minutes go by, both the fastest and slowest 30 minutes of my life. I repeat the process and it plays out exactly the same way, except five minutes later I hear the bear snort just a little to the left of where it had been. I wait another 20 minutes or so and now something has changed. I tried throwing a rock at the bear again, no reaction. I think I held it together walking past where the bear was and then ran a two-minute half-mile straight uphill. With only five creek chubs to show for the whole ordeal, I will never be back to that area again. When I was a teenager, a guy was screaming for help in the woods. I still remember I just got home from a friend's. It was around 8 p.m. My parents kept trying to yell back hello and we or hear things of that nature. He wouldn't respond. Just intermediate calls for help. When I first heard his scream, I immediately ran and hid in my bedroom. It was a blood-curdling scream. Gives me chills just thinking about it. Filled me with fear just hearing his scream. The next day, everyone searched the woods and found nothing. Nothing was ever in the news. I will never understand. Why didn't he yell back? Where did he come from? We lived in the middle of nowhere. No close neighbors. Sometimes I think he was trying to lure us in. He would have seen our lights from our house. The woods was a hill. Back in college, I entered a tournament as a co-angler on Rodman Reservoir in Ocala National Forest. Boulder told me to meet him at the lake at 5 a.m. I hit the road around 3.30 a.m. Should put me there about 15 minutes early. I'm driving through Ocala National Forest, and the fog this particular morning is thick. I'm probably driving 30 in a 55 due to the limited visibility. I come around a corner, and all of a sudden, I see the whitest lady I've ever seen in my life walking towards me in the lane. Clearly just substance abuse going on, but could easily pass for a zombie ghost. I pull into the oncoming traffic lane and hit my brakes to miss her. I come to a stop about 15 feet past her and watch her turn around like a zombie and start walking towards my truck. I went ahead and got out of there. Since then, I've had a similar thing happen in almost the same area with a regular-looking guy that appeared to have a bit too much to drink. Another time, guy just crossing the road around midnight, no vehicles around. I've got several buddies that have similar stories of people walking in the oncoming lane, seemingly in the middle of nowhere out in the Ocala National Forest, and they had to swerve to miss them. Weird thing is, it always seems to happen five, ten miles from the closest building that shows up on the map, and these aren't hikers. No clue what these people are doing out there. It all started on a quiet summer night in Wisconsin. I was visiting a friend's cabin deep in the woods, away from the hustle and bustle of city life. It was a perfect escape. Or so I thought. We were sitting around the campfire, swapping stories and laughing, when suddenly I felt a strange sensation. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it was as if we were being watched. I scanned the dark forest around us, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Later that night, as I was walking back to the cabin from the outhouse, I caught a glimpse of something that sent a shiver down my spine. Red glowing eyes stared at me from the darkness, watching my every move. I couldn't see the creature's body, but the intensity of its gaze was enough to make me hurry back to the safety of the cabin. I didn't mention the encounter to my friends, not wanting to scare them or be labeled as a paranoid city slicker. But the image of those red eyes haunted me for the remainder of the trip. A few years later, I found myself in Pennsylvania on a camping trip with some buddies. We had chosen a remote location, surrounded by dense woods and miles from the nearest town. Once again, I felt that familiar sense of being watched, and my mind drifted back to that night in Wisconsin. 
As the sun dipped below the horizon, we huddled around the campfire, its warm glow providing some comfort against the encroaching darkness. We chatted in roasted marshmallows, trying to ignore the eerie stillness of the woods around us. When nature called, I hesitated, remembering my previous encounter. But eventually, I couldn't put it off any longer. As I ventured away from the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling of being followed. And then, it happened again. Those same red glowing eyes appeared in the darkness, watching me intently. I stood there, frozen in fear, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature remained hidden, its body obscured by the shadows. But something told me it was a dogman, a legendary creature said to roam the woods of the Midwest and the East Coast. If I had seen its body, I'm sure I would be even more terrified than I already was. I hurried back to the campsite, my mind racing with thoughts of the mysterious creature. I shared my encounter with my friends this time, and we decided to pack up and leave first thing in the morning. To this day, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if I'd seen the full form of the creature with the red glowing eyes. Would I be more heavily affected by the encounters, unable to enjoy the serenity of the woods? Or would I have come face to face with a legend, forever changing my perception of the unknown? All I know for sure is that those two encounters have left me with a deep respect for the mysteries that still linger in the wilderness, a reminder that we may never fully understand the secrets that lie hidden in the shadows. My name is John, and I'm part of a National Guard unit assigned to protect the small town of Smallville, situated near a dense forest. The town had become the epicenter of a series of brutal attacks, and it was our job to protect the residents and track down the perpetrator. As we investigated the crime scenes, we found evidence of an unknown cryptid, which we suspected to be the legendary dogman. To aid in our search, we enlisted the help of a renowned cryptozoologist who had dedicated his life to studying these elusive creatures. Together, we delved deep into the surrounding woods, determined to confront the creature and put an end to the carnage. As we got closer to the truth, we uncovered a long-buried secret about the government's involvement in the creation and cover-up of these creatures. It was a chilling revelation that made us question everything we thought we knew about the world around us. One night, while we were searching for the creature, we heard blood-curdling screams echoing from the small town. Rushing back, our hearts pounded in our chests as we realized the horrifying truth. The entire town was gone, and all its inhabitants had been mercilessly killed. We were devastated and felt an overwhelming sense of guilt knowing that we had failed to protect the people we had been assigned to safeguard. But before we could even begin to process what had happened, government officials arrived at the scene. They quickly quarantined the area and ordered us to return home, offering no explanation or consolation. We left Smallville with heavy hearts, haunted by the loss of an entire community, and the knowledge that we had been so close to uncovering the truth about the dogmen. The government had successfully silenced us and covered up their dark secrets, but the memory of Smallville and its people would remain with us forever. It all began when the whisper of chainsaws echoed through the sacred lands of my people, the Comanche tribe. I'm all away, which means pee in our language a reminder of how small we are in the grand scheme of things. Little did I know, the grand scheme had a cruel twist in store for us. Our ancestral lands, once lush with ancient trees and teeming with life, were being violated by a ruthless logging company. Every fallen tree seemed to resonate with a piercing cry, reverberating through the air, through my heart. And then we noticed it the increase in sightings of a malicious skinwalker. The skinwalker, a creature of Navajo legend, was known to shape, shift, and bring harm. It was an entity of pure malevolence, a perversion of nature. It began to terrorize the loggers who were far from their comfort zones and their high-rise offices. 
The assaults from the creature were so relentless, so terrifying, that the company halted its operations. Our tribe was relieved, at least initially. But then the attacks escalated. It started with livestock. Sheep and cows mutilated, their carcasses left as a gruesome warning. Then our people started disappearing. Our tribe, once vibrant and strong, was being decimated. Fear clung to us like a shroud. Elders prayed. Warriors stood guard. Children cried. But nothing stopped the skinwalker. One by one, my people fell, their lives snuffed out by this ancient terror. Until I was the only one left, the skinwalker had taken everyone, my family, my friends, the old, the young. I was alone, the last of my tribe, left to bear witness to our tragic end. The government arrived in the aftermath. Men in suits and uniforms swarmed our lands, their faces grim. They quarantined the area, erected barriers, and shrouded our tragedy under the guise of a disease outbreak. They found me grief-stricken lost, and they told me to be silent to hide the truth of the skinwalker, the reality of our ancestral lands, and the massacre of my people. The world continued on, oblivious to our fate, ignorant of the truth. I became a Lawa, the lone survivor of the Comanche tribe, the guardian of a tragic secret, a living testament to a tale too horrific to be believed. But I remember, I remember it all. I was working as a park ranger this one time when I heard something pretty weird from one of the campers. It was low season and we only had a few bookings. One, a group of Boy Scouts and their two leaders who were both middle-aged moms. Two, a very small church group, all female. And three, two college girls who had been doing some sort of nature photography shoot and research had appeared. So, a lot of females, aside from a small group of young Boy Scouts, there were around five of them, and I'd say they were all preteen, and that's important to note for the story. You see, in the morning, while the Scouts were cooking their breakfast and the church ladies were doing their prayer circle, one of the college girls came storming over to the office, making and filing a complaint. She said that there had been a man outside their tent during the night. They knew it was a man as he mumbled a couple of things and laughed. He'd had apparently a very deep voice. She said he was drunk and that he had urinated on the side of the tent. Again, not only from the voice, but the height of where the urine had hit the tent. they known it was a guy and not one of the little boys. Sure enough, I headed over to their tent at the location. They said it happened, and sure enough, there was a strong smell of human urine. There were also three empty beer cans on the floor and multiple cigarette butts. No one on that site claimed to have brought any alcohol with them, and none of them seemed like secret drinkers. And there had been no cider smell of tobacco. Thing is, our campsite is miles away from anywhere. You would have to drive to get here, and there were no obvious signs of anybody else coming on to or through the site. It was enough to freak everybody out, and they all packed up and left. Can't say I blame them. We kept watch overnight for the next week or so, but never saw anything and never had any more complaints. Maybe the girls just made the whole thing up. I don't know. It didn't feel like it, though. In between the beer cans, cigarettes, and urine smell, it seems like a lot to waste your time on and a lot of a story to build up for what. The night was thick, and the only light that pierced through the darkness was the flickering flames from our campfire. The calm serenity of the lake mirrored the starry night sky, creating a tranquil ambience that was often sought but seldom found. We were surrounded by the deep woods, the lake stretching out before us. Suddenly the tranquility was broken by a strange noise from across the lake. It was a distant rustle. An unusual sound that didn't fit the usual nighttime symphony of insects and nocturnal creatures. We hastily fed the fire, coaxing it to grow brighter, illuminating the surrounding landscape with its warm orange glow. Just as the fire grew stronger, so did the noises. Something was over there, something big. We could hear it crashing through the underbrush, snapping branches and rustling leaves. 
Then came the rocks and logs lobbed in our direction with an incredible force, splashing into the lake and thudding around our campsite. The fire cast monstrous shadows that danced and twisted with each explosive splash and thud. And then the screams began. They were unlike anything I had ever heard before. I've spent my entire life in the woods, hunting, exploring, living. I've heard the cries of bobcats, the hoots of owls, the howls of wolves. But this, this was different. It was a guttural, primal sound that resonated through the forest, sending a chill down my spine. The screams and the onslaught of debris continued for a harrowing hour. Each minute was stretched by the adrenaline pumping through our veins, making every second feel like an eternity. But then, just as suddenly it had begun, everything went silent. The only sound left was the crackling of our fire and our own heavy breathing. We were left in the strange quiet of the night, the echoes of the creature's scream still ringing in our ears. The experience was unnerving, to say the least. Whatever had been out there was clearly powerful, and its cries still haunt me. It was a reminder that even though I've spent a lifetime in these woods, there are still mysteries here that I've yet to uncover. I have heard the story of the Quaker man who left Philadelphia to start a new life in the mountains of Pennsylvania. He was a man of strong faith, and after purchasing a large lot in Cook Township, he found employment at the Old South Mountain Iron Works. The land was perfect for him, with a stream full of brook trout, plentiful timber, and lots of open space to raise a family. He soon met a young woman and fell deeply in love with her. They were married by the local justice of the peace, despite the fact that she was not of the same religious faith as he was. However, they were happy together, and she soon became pregnant. In the final month of her pregnancy, the young wife began to experience bouts of anger and intense pain. The doctor could not diagnose the cause of her malady and ordered her to complete bed rest. The Quaker had a horrible dream that the devil had come to visit their home while he was at work. He was sure that his wife was possessed by a demonic being and that he needed to purge her of this evil. For ten days straight he knelt by her bedside, invoking prayers and charms, much to the chagrin of his wife. However, his wife soon became disgusted by the fuss her husband was making. In a fit of rage, she grabbed a small wooden cross and flung it out of the window. She declared that there was no God and that the devil was only a creation of a feeble mind. That very night, the Quaker's wife went into labor. She told in agony for the entire night and into the early morning. A midwife was quickly summoned for the delivery. Soon after daybreak, the child started its way into the world. As the midwife coaxed the new mother to push, it soon became apparent that this child was unlike any she had ever witnessed. The newborn boys resembled a beast, not a human. It was alive and breathing, but did not cry or make any sound. It was gray in color and had more scales than skin. It had a long tail and small horn buds above its pointed ears. There were claws for hands and hooves for feet. It also emitted a foul, lingering stench. This was the embodiment of Mephistopheles. The Quaker was horrified and could not believe that this was his child. He refused to even touch it. The midwife, who had seen many things in her time, was shocked and did not know what to do. The child lived for only a few minutes before passing away. The Quaker's wife died soon after giving birth. The Quaker was left alone with his thoughts and his beliefs. He eventually left the mountains and returned to Philadelphia, where he tried to reconcile his faith with the terrible thing that had happened to him. The story of the Quaker and his wife has been passed down through generations. Some say it was a curse. Others say it was a punishment for the wife's blasphemy. But the truth remains a mystery, lost to time and to the mountains of Pennsylvania. Okay, this happened a couple of years ago before we turned 18 and before uni started, so we had a lot of spare time and nowhere to spend it, so my friends and I would often just walk around our town at night talking about random stuff. 
On the night in question, it was just me and one friend, and we were just walking without really paying attention to where we were going since we were in pretty deep conversation. We found ourselves walking towards an entrance to a footpath that's behind an estate. There's a fork in the path, and going left will eventually take you to the high street and a train station. Going right will take you to some fields behind a cemetery. We went right, which sounds like a dumb idea, but it made sense at the time, because you could get into the cemetery through the fields and then on to the estate, where we lived by coming out of the cemetery. Initially, I didn't even want to go down the path in the first place. I'm scared of the dark and generally would rather not walk through a graveyard and a bunch of creepy forests, paths at night. My friend reassured me, though, and after all, it was the quickest way home. About five minutes in, the path leads through a small wooded area, and after that, there is the gate that opens into the cemetery. It's really dark in this part, except for some distant lights from houses, allowing you to see a little bit in front of you. That's when we saw a figure in the distance, walking towards us. From what I could make out, it just looked like one guy, probably a similar age to us, because teens would often use this path to get from one estate to the other. I quietly told my friend that, and he agreed. We weren't worried because while there are some bad kids in our area, people don't really give you any trouble when they're on their own, as the person walked closer to us. In us to them, I realized it was not a teenager, but a really tall man. Trying to calm myself, I remembered a tall guy I see a lot walking his dog, a big Alsatian. Yes, it must be him. I scanned the area for his dog, but I saw nothing. However, the man was holding something long in his hand. I thought it was a lead for his dog, but it wasn't flexible, and in the dark and in my paranoid state, I thought it looked like the handle of an axe or a spade. My friend and I hadn't said a word since the man got close, but I just knew he was thinking the exact same thing as me. I didn't want the man to notice that I was staring at him, so I just looked down and walked as fast as I could without running. Thankfully, the gate was right there, and once we got into the cemetery, we felt safe. Once we got out into the open, we started talking about what we saw, and my friend agreed. It looked like an axe or a really big stick and said... I was expecting to get a blow to the head as soon as we got near him. I babbled a bit. Sorry, but I certainly stay away from dark paths now. Hello all. I wanted to share these two stories I have from my childhood that have always stuck with me and still creep me out to this day. Story 1. This story is short, but makes me feel uneasy nonetheless. I was in kindergarten as Mrs. Quigley's class. I loved her, when she got a call from the office that someone was there to pick me up. I think this was before the time of, like, emergency contact forms with designated people to sign you out, because this happened so long ago. I can't remember if there was a name given or not, but I do remember being five years old and not feeling right. I told Mrs. Quigley I didn't know that person and didn't want to go with them. She didn't make me, and I rode the bus home as usual that day. I can't help but think that situation was something bad because I don't remember it ever being a problem that I didn't get picked up that day, like it wasn't planned and it wasn't inconvenient that I didn't go with them. Story 2. My cousin and I were playing outside in a wooded area near her house, and this wooded area was also next to a road. I just remember we were playing in there, then this pickup truck stopped on the road next to us. I don't remember what he said. I just remember taking off and my cousin tripping over a branch and falling. I was too scared to help her. Back when I was younger, around 12, 13, my three friends and I, also the same age, had a fort right at the tree line by some woods near our neighborhood. Right next to the tree line was a series of fields used for sports. So technically, our fort was on that property and not the woods. Separating the woods from the fields was a large chain-link fence. One day after a large storm, one of the trees from our fort was knocked over leaning against the fence, 
naturally as kids. We thought that was awesome, except for ruining part of the fort. We all climbed up on the tree, sat on it, and whatnot. After some time, we were just sitting there having a conversation when I noticed one of my friends, who was not on the tree, was looking kind of past us. On the other side of the fence, Buck guys, he said in a shaky tone. We all turned around, and on the other side of the fence, about twenty feet away, was an old man. He was dressed in tattered clothes, including a newsboy hat. He looked to be in his mid-fifties to sixty. He stood there smiling at us. I definitely sensed some malicious intent with him, which is creepy in itself. But the part that gets me the most was how long he must have been there watching us, easily fifteen, twenty minutes before my friend noticed. In what seemed like forever, none of us spoke, and all we could do was stare back at him. My adrenaline kicked in, and my reaction was to just run away, where my friends also followed. After a few minutes or so, we gained the courage to go back, and when we did, he was gone. It kind of scared us, and we really never went back to that fort. Now the fence is replaced, and the fort is gone, but, but my friends and I will never forget that creepy man. I was about 16 years old at home alone for the night. I fell asleep just fine, but I woke up later at around 3. I couldn't fall back asleep, and then I started hearing this weird high-pitched ring in my ears. It kept getting louder, and then out of nowhere, my door starts creaking open. It's the loudest door on earth, and I hear really slow, dragging footsteps walking into my room. I turned to see if anyone was there, and the doorway is completely empty, and I heard the footsteps start moving towards my bed with the ringing in my ears getting louder. I flipped out and rolled over, facing away from the footsteps, feeling pretty helpless. I thought it went away when I heard the stepping stop until I felt something sit on my bed. I honestly have never prayed harder in my life. Eventually, it just kind of stopped all at once, and I just laid there wide awake for the rest of the night. I told my mom about it a day later, and she said that she used to hear the same dragging footsteps, too. I changed rooms away from the basement after that. When I was around eight years old, my family and I lived in this old house that always gave me the creeps. Especially this one room that was kept as our study. Every time I'd walk in or pass this room, I just felt yucky and had the most intense feeling that I was being watched by someone that hated me being in there. Anyways, fast forward a few months. And my father decided that he was going to make the study room mine as I was sharing a room with my younger brother. I begged him to give it to my younger brother instead. I was the eldest, so I should get to pick. Mm, had not ended up being my room. First night in this room ended up being my last. This part I remember like it was literally yesterday. My dad came in and said good night and proceeded to turn off my bedroom light. As soon as he left the room, I felt that intense foreboding feeling I'd had had every other time I had been in this room. Except that this time I was different. It was like I could feel a set of eyes on me. I pulled my blankets up over me as I was that scared. After about 30 seconds, the blankets started being pulled down and left me staring into my room with no apparent reason or cause. I looked around quickly and then pulled the blankets back over my head, and again, blankets started to be pulled off me. By this stage, I was scared out of my wits. I remember telling myself that it was probably just my cat playing around, but I looked under my bed and around the room, and my cat was not in my room. I then told myself that I'm going to pull the blankets back up over my head, but if something starts to pull off my blankets, then I'm out of here. No matter what my father says, I pulled the blankets back over my head slowly whilst looking around the room for anything that could be doing this to me. After another 30 seconds, my blankets began to be pulled off me, and this time I booked it out of my room so fast it was unreal. By this stage, I was in tears of fear and my dad couldn't console or convince me to go back into that room. This all is 100% true, and I remember it like it happened a week ago, when it was in fact well over 20 years ago. 
Also, my brother and I had reoccurring night terrors in this house. Someone broke into the house, and they broke in by smashing the window to the study room, the room that was foreboding and haunted. They, however, cut themselves so severely on the window of the study room that they left empty-handed. There was loads of blood all over the window and side of the house where they had tried to crawl in through the smashed window and into the study room. That room was just wrong. My family lived in Vermont for several years in a small town called Northfield, south of Montpellier. There's a local legend in Northfield of a thing known as the Pigman. The story has multiple versions, as most do, but some parts are always the same. Back in 1951, the night before Halloween, this 17-year-old kid named Sam Harris went out on his own with a basket of eggs to cause some mischief. Nobody knows exactly what happened to him, just that he never came home and was never found. Years later, some high school kids were out drinking behind the school one night during a dance when this thing came walking out of the woods on two human legs. It was naked, covered in white hair, and was wearing a hollowed-out pig's head like some grotesque mask. Naturally, the kids tore out of there and went and told people. Word spread and some farmer admitted he'd seen a figure matching that description digging through his garbage one night. Some pigs had also gone missing recently. More sightings were made of the pigmen as it became known, but many times the claims were just kids wanting to get attention. Now, whether this thing is Sam Harris or this thing is Sam Harris, nobody in town knows for sure. But what they do know is that it isn't afraid of people, and it really likes to eat meat. There's a place just outside of Northfield known as the Devil's Wash Bowl, with a river and waterfalls and several caves. After more sightings of the pigmen were made out by the wash bowl, some people went investigating and found that one cave in particular was littered with animal bones, some of which were pig. It got around that they'd found the lair of the pigmen, and it became popular for teens to go out to the devil's wash bowl at night and try to catch sight of him. My sister and a couple of her friends went out to the devil's wash bowl their senior year. They took sleeping bags and flashlights and all the gear you'd take to go camping. I wasn't there to give a first-hand account of what transpired. I was only eight at the time. I can only tell you what was told to me. There were six or eight of them, depending on who you ask. All couples. They picked several caves. One for each pair. My sister and her boyfriend were in their cave. She was rolling out their sleeping bags, and he was trying to start a fire when they heard some shouts and then screaming from one of the other caves. When they got there, the girl was curled up in a ball in the farthest corner of the cave, and her boyfriend was nowhere to be found. She told them that the pigmen had come trudging into their cave, completely undaunted by their presence. The guy had started shouting at it, both to drive it away and to get the other's attention. The pigman casually picked up a large rock and struck the guy in the side of the head with it, knocking him unconscious. It picked him up, slung him over its shoulder, and shambled out of the cave just moments before the rest arrived. Nobody had seen it exit the cave, nor seen signs of it at all. They did find the rock lying on the cave floor with blood on it and bare footprints in some soft creek mud outside. The girls all drove into town and went straight to the police. The remaining boys, whether it was two or three of them, grabbed flashlights and makeshift weapons and scoured the woods around the area. The footprints disappeared at the edge of the road, and they lost the trail there. Search parties were set up, police in nine units, and a big coordinated effort, including several other adjoining townships' police forces. A couple of days later, some articles of the guy's clothes were found by a search dog. They had been left torn and scattered in an abandoned farmhouse a town over. The missing teen's photo was put up in the area, and one guy came forward. He said the other night he'd awakened to the sound of someone lurking outside his house. He checked out his kitchen window, and someone was rummaging through the trash can by his garage. The person was only wearing a faded and ripped pair of jeans. When the man hit the porch light, the intruder looked up and looked just like the kid in the photo. The only difference was that his body was covered with white hair and his eyes looked kind of hollow. Mm -hmm. 
The call came in on a sweltering Texas afternoon, the kind that makes the air feel heavy and the horizon shimmer with heat. I was sitting at my desk at the local police station, my boots propped up as I sipped on a lukewarm cup of coffee. The voice on the other end was tense, hurried, and it sent a shiver down my spine. It was a call I'd never expected, a call that would thrust me into the heart of an enigma that defied all explanation. Some of our park rangers are dead. Something, something unknown took them out, the voice on the other end said, a tremor of fear in his words. We need your expertise, Sheriff. We need you out here in the National Forest. I knew that this was no ordinary case. With a heavy sigh, I put down my coffee and stared out the window at the blazing sun. I was a police officer born and raised in the vast expanses of Texas, but nothing could have prepared me for what lay ahead. I agreed to head out to the National Park, where the unforgiving terrain held secrets I couldn't even begin to fathom. When I arrived at the National Park, I was met with a somber group of officers, their expressions a mix of anxiety and determination. We were issued stun guns, a peculiar choice for a law enforcement operation. The Forest Service Administration had given us a clear mandate, capture, not kill. There was something out there, something that might be a new species of cryptid, and they wanted to be the first to have one detained. The gravity of the situation settled over us as we ventured into the dense forest, our footsteps muffled by the layers of leaves and underbrush. With every step, the feeling of being watched intensified, and the shadows seemed to stretch and twist and unnatural ways. I exchanged glances with the other officers, a silent understanding passing between us. We were venturing into the unknown, and none of us knew what awaited us. Hours turned into a day that felt endless, the tension mounting as the forest seemed to close in around us. And then, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the world was bathed in the eerie glow of twilight, we found ourselves standing before a clearing. In the center stood a figure, one that was both familiar and utterly alien. The creature was massive, its form stretched upward on two hind legs. Its arms were impossibly long, reaching the ground like a gorilla, but its spine was crooked, contorting its entire frame. Moonlight danced on its gray skin, and its eyes shone like twin orbs of light in the darkness. Its face was grotesque, a deformed mask that held no semblance of humanity. The officers around me raised their stun guns, and the air was filled with the crackling of electricity as we fired in unison. But the creature moved with unnatural speed, a blur of motion as it tackled officers to the ground. Panic surged through me as I fired my stun gun, the darts embedding in the creature's flesh. And then, almost miraculously, the creature fell to the ground, stunned by the sheer number of darts. We approached it cautiously, our breaths heavy in the still night air. Just as we began to bind its limbs, the forest erupted with movement, and a group of figures emerged from the shadows. They wore black, their faces obscured by masks, and their presence sent a chill down my spine. See operatives, no doubt about it. Step away, one of them commanded, their tone cold and commanding. This is a matter of national security. As we moved back, they pulled out a black cadaver bag, a chilling indication of their intentions. They ordered us to leave, to be silent, their threats laced with an air of finality. The weight of their words hung in the air as we retreated, the forest swallowing us whole once more. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled onto something beyond our understanding, something that was meant to remain hidden. As I drove away from the National Park, I couldn't help but glance back, my mind swirling with questions in a sense of unease that would linger long after this encounter. My grandma told me this story about Chanakis. Her mom, my great-grandmother, and her brother used to go to the river to do the laundry. She used to leave the boy on a hammock while she was busy. One day the boy began to walk into the sugarcane plantations that were next to the river when his mom realized and dragged him out he was saying that some kids were offering him papaya. She told him that they were alone there and there was no one else nearby. 
She put him on the hammock and continued doing the laundry, but the boy kept going into the cane plantation. This situation repeated many times, but the last time she realized the boy wasn't there, she ran into the plantation and found him. She scolded him, and he was swearing again that some kids were offering him papaya. When she looked up, she could. She'd eat the canes moving, like if three people running between them. She got scared and left suddenly. Days after talking with other people, they told her that those kids could have been Chanakis that were trying to steal her kid. So she never brought him back to the river. Some days, when she was there alone, someone would throw her pebbles while she was distracted. I was sleeping in my studio and suddenly darted awake, fully alert, almost instinctual. A deep sense of dread and anxiety came over me as soon as I awoke, and a feeling of a presence was in my kitchen twenty feet away. It was a completely new and isolated experience. This has never happened to me. I mean, I shot up awake and felt deep dread like a draining presence. It was like a totally different sense was activated honestly chilling. It wasn't from a nightmare. I didn't see or hear anything. I don't have depression or anxiety. Nothing that would rationalize this experience. So anyways, I'm looking at the kitchen and sensing something and feeling a level of dread and anxiety I have never ever felt in my life. So I call my dog on the bed and hug him and try to block it out. I ask him to please protect me be my guardian, and I buried my head into him just wanting this to pass. Nothing has happened since. Until, several months later, my best friend Dog sits for me, lives in my studio for a week. Fast forward another couple months, and she hears my original story for the first time. She tells me while she Dog sat, she had that same experience. A sudden wake up on high alert and scared anxious and feeling something in the kitchen. I thought that was really trippy and profound and confirms I wasn't crazy. What was it? What did it want? Did it wake me or did my own senses protect me? Did something else protect me? It's so interesting, and I wonder if any other have had stories similar to this. By the way, my dog was chilling, thank God. I would have been even more freaked out if he sensed the presence. From my early childhood through my late teens, I lived with a trio of shadowy figures that trailed me like spectral companions. Three ethereal entities, each with its own distinct form and presence, and each tied to a specific location or time of day. The first was a woman shrouded in a cape. She was the night visitor, materializing only when I was asleep. She would stand at the foot of my bed, silent and still. Her presence was unnerving, but she never did anything more than stand there, watching me from the shadows. The sight of her was a nocturnal constant, a ghostly figure looming in the darkness of my room. The second was a childlike figure that haunted our backyard, always hiding behind the starfruit tree. This one only appeared while I was cooking in our kitchen late at night. I would glance out the window and see it there, standing still and staring at me. It was a creepy sight, a small figure illuminated by the faint moonlight, always watching, never moving. The last one was the most bizarre, a man without a torso who seemed to hover around as if gravity didn't apply to him. He wasn't bound by the rules of the other two. He would follow me in broad daylight, appearing suddenly in the most unexpected places. He was a constant reminder of this spectral trio's presence, a haunting figure that seemed to linger in my peripheral vision, no matter where I was or what time of day it was. These three figures were my constant companions for many years, a trinity of shadows that seemed inextricably tied to my existence. Their presence was unsettling, yet over the years I came to accept them as a part of my life, their motives, their origins, their true nature, all remain a mystery to me, but they were a part of my world, a spectral triad that shadowed my every step from childhood to adulthood. In May 2020, one, I took a trip to New Orleans, 
a city famous for its rich history and tales of the supernatural. We stayed at an Airbnb, a comfortable place that felt welcoming, if not a little old. One night I woke up abruptly from a deep sleep, my gaze instinctively drawn to the bathroom. A peculiar certainty washed over me. There was someone in the bathroom. I squinted into the semi-darkness, my vision blurred without my glasses. I could discern the shape of a man standing eerily in the bathtub. His back turned to me. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, but the figure remained. I felt an icy chill run down my spine, but eventually sleep reclaimed me. On the day of our departure, all of us left the air bomb except for one girl from our group who had a later flight. Later, she confided in us about a strange experience she had after we left. She heard the sound of footsteps echoing down the hallway, and then a whisper as soft as the rustling of leaves. Slave. Intrigued and disturbed, she researched the history of the area where our air bambine was located. To her surprise and horror, she discovered that the site was once a bustling slave trading post. The realization struck us all with a sense of dread and melancholy, a ghostly echo from the past intruding into our present. The haunting memories of our stay in that air beam blingered long after our trip, a chilling reminder of New Orleans' spectral past. The city, rich with history, had shared with us a glimpse into its dark past, a tale of sorrow and injustice that time had failed to erase. This just happened a few hours ago. I have called and reported it to the police, and I am home safely, but guess I am still in shock. Could do with putting it down in writing to process it, and figured this is as good a place as any to share what happened. I finished work early today and so decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided my usual route, which crossed May roads, would not be very practical, and so I took an alternate route along a canal towpath and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well. I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the way back around six kilometer into the route. It is a long straight path with a canal on the left side, and on there right there is wasteland where some factories used to be, but have mostly been demolished. It has been left abandoned for as long as I can remember and is overgrown with trees and weeds. But there are the odd bits of an old factory that for some reason weren't fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory, which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it, I noticed a rough-looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming and shouted something, but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was, I heard him say, Wait there. Can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps, and so I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps was meaning. We were standing just a few feet apart, but with a fence in between us. It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes at the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I would help him find his phone again, saying he had dropped it somewhere nearby, and asked if I could ring his number so he could listen for it. I felt I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm, so I said he could tell me the number, and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out a phone number, but said it far too fast, and it didn't begin with seven, which made me start to feel like something wasn't right. Although I was beginning to suspect at this point, I wasn't really worried. I am in pretty good shape. Had a big size and weight advantage over him. Plus, there was a fence between us. He didn't seem in very good physical shape and seemed like he might be homeless. I figured if he was trying to mug me for my phone, his only chance would be if he pulled a knife, so I made sure to stay a good distance away from the fence and kept my eye on where his hands were. So I told him I didn't catch any of the numbers because he said it too quickly, and he came out with another number. This time it did have seven at the beginning. I entered seven numbers, and then he started to look around and saying I can hear it. Come and help me look as he looked around at the ground. I was about to say that I hadn't even finished dialing when a much larger black guy appeared from behind a section of wall to my right. He was also really scruffy looking, and... 
From the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drug. He came out saying he could hear the phone ringing over towards him and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The white guy then said it is ringing. Yeah? And I told him it was even though I still hadn't dialed the last digits, and now I was sure they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three times of them both beckoning me to come and help, always insisting they could hear the ring, I heard the black guy say, he's not going to fall for it. He said it in a hushed way, as if he thought I wouldn't hear, but with it being out in the middle of nowhere, I could clearly understand what he said. The white guy then started acting quite aggressive and punched a tree, telling me he needed the phone badly and how his whole life was on the phone, telling me to come and help them look for it. While he was punching the tree and ranting, the black guy had taken a few steps away to the right meaning I couldn't keep my eyes on both at the same time. It was after 5 p.m. by this point and had gotten dark all of a sudden, which made the whole thing even more unsettling. I noticed there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed right where the black guy was heading, and I decided at that point to get the hell out of there and made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. If they genuinely lost their phone and needed help, I would expect them to shout, where are you going, or something to try and get me to come back, but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20-30 seconds, I turned to see if they were chasing me. They were both stood on the path around where the gap in the fence had been, but were not chasing me. They were just standing there, watching me run away. I continued running away, but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight. It was at this point I got off the canal path and onto the roads. The person I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions, but seemed to think it wasn't anything worth worrying about, but said it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved, and I'm pretty sure I won't be jogging that route alone anytime soon. Sir... My name is Megan. I am forwarding a summary of an experience that I and a friend had in August 2010. My friend and associate, Kira, and I traveled from Columbus, Ohio, to Ravenswood, West Virginia, on business. While we were there, I wanted to make a sad trip to Gallipolis, Ohio, to visit relatives I had not seen for quite a while. After our meeting and presentation, we drove on to Ohio Route 7 and traveled south along the Ohio River towards Gallipolis. We had a nice, though brief, visit with my relatives. Around 6 p.m., we left their home and drove a few miles north on Rowett 7 to check into a hotel near the local airport. Around 7.30 p.m., we decided to get dinner and found a quiet restaurant so we could eat and work. After we finished, Kira needed to go to the store and pick up a few items that she forgot to pack. We headed to a Walmart that was nearby the restaurant. After we finished shopping, we were walking to the car when I noticed a woman running through the parking lot. When she reached her car, she looked back in the direction of the store and then hurriedly got into the car. I quickly looked in the same direction and saw what looked like a large bird flying above the roof of the store. It was difficult to see, but when it swooped downward the parking lot, lights would shine off of it. It looked like it was either oily or had shiny leather-like skin. Whatever it was, it had a wide wingspan. I would guess it reached eight, ten feet across. It circled above the store for about a minute, then just disappeared. We were both somewhat shocked at what we witnessed, but figured that it was just a huge bird. Since it was dark, I figured we had misjudged what it really was. We drove back to the hotel and decided to call it a night so we could get an early start on the drive home in the morning. I got ready for bed, but thought I'd watch some television first. By this time, it was around 10 p.m. or so. I must have dozed off fairly quickly because the next thing I remember is frantic knocking on my door. I stumbled out of bed and checked who it was. It was Kira, and she was obviously upset. She rushed into my room and said, It's here. What are you talking about? A little bit perturbed that she woke me up. She said that she was laying on the bed, reading when she heard something in the hallway. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and listened to what she thought were scratching sounds. 
After a few minutes, the sound stopped, so she went back to bed. Not long after she lay down, she heard more scratching sounds, but from outside her window. Again, she got up and peeked through the curtains. This time, something looked back at her. Our rooms were on the second floor in the back section of the hotel, and both looked out onto a small parking lot and a large field beyond that. She could see what she described as a bald, ugly man with wings who was looking directly at her with large, bulging eyes that lit up bright red. It was there for only a few seconds. It then spread its wings while running at the same time toward the end of the parking lot and lifted off the ground like a bird. You're kidding, right? I muttered to her. Meg, I swear to God, that thing is out there, and it knows we saw it. I knew the only way I was going to get some sleep was to allow Kira to stay in my room. The next morning, we woke early, checked out, and drove back to Columbus. Kira didn't mention the incident from the previous night during the ride. In fact, she has still never said anything else about it. We continue to be good friends and have a very good working relationship. But I got curious. I'd never heard about the Mothman or any of the tales associated with it. I grew up in Texas and had only lived in Ohio for a few years. I moved into my mom's house after she had passed away. Her relatives lived throughout Ohio, but I had never been told any of the stories. This is the reason I'm writing to you. We were near Point Pleasant, W.V., when we had this encounter. Do you think that it is possible that this was a Mothman? I read some of your posts recently, and I'm starting to believe that Kira actually saw something supernatural. In light of the prophecies of danger that this thing is supposed to warn people about, Kira has had some bad luck and tragedy since that day. Her husband suddenly left her. She had a fire in her house, and she severely injured her leg in a fall. Could this be connected? I personally don't believe in predictions, either good or bad. But I will admit that these have been strange times since we witnessed whatever. I have been visited by otherworldly beings since 1974. I've had missing time many times over the past 48 years and have been abducted countless times. I did have one experience in 1999 that I had reoccurring dreams, a night that happened at my home in northern Wisconsin. I remember being taken from my bed, being led into my living room. I remember seeing things around me. I was shown a young girl 12 years old or so. I remember knowing that I was the child's father. I remember being so angry that I was used over years to create this abomination. I had, for as long as I can remember, maybe 25 years, kept a gun in my bed under my pillow. I had it in my hand. I remember being so angry that I was able to pull free, and I shot and killed the girl. I am a law enforcement officer. Since that day, I put it away, and I have trouble handling it. After shooting the girl, I remember being punished. I've had, had lumps in my arms that hurt and remain today. Each time that they come, they find different ways to make me suffer. All this time, I hesitate to tell anyone else about any of my sightings, but I, I did report my story to MUFON. They called me and made me feel like a criminal. It was December 2000, and the winter chill had settled in. I lived in a small town called Malala, located southeast of Oregon. The snowy hills off Hunter Road were a popular spot for hiking and exploring, and I had decided to venture out that day to enjoy the tranquility of nature. I had always been fascinated by the mysterious stories of Bigfoot, but never truly believed in its existence. Little did I know that my perspective would change drastically during that fateful hike. As I trudged through the soft snow, enjoying the crisp air and the crunch of snow beneath my boots, I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I found a set of tracks unlike any I had ever seen before. There were a dozen of them, each measuring 14 inches in length with an astonishing stride of five and a half feet. The elevation of the area was about 1,500 feet and the remoteness of the location added to the eeriness of the discovery. I couldn't believe my eyes. The tracks were clearly not human, nor did they resemble any known animal in the area. 
My heart raced as I considered the possibility that these tracks could belong to the elusive Bigfoot. I decided to follow the tracks, curious to see where they would lead. As I continued on, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. I was acutely aware of the eerie silence around me, punctuated only by the crunch of my footsteps and the occasional rustle of a bird or squirrel in the trees. Despite my apprehension, I pressed on, driven by a burning curiosity. The tracks led me deeper into the hills, and I began to wonder if I was on the verge of making a groundbreaking discovery. Suddenly, the track stopped at the edge of a small clearing. I scanned the area, searching for any sign of the creature that had left the tracks. But there was nothing. No broken branches, no tufts of fur, no lingering scent. It was as if the creature had simply vanished. Disappointed and feeling a mix of fear and fascination, I decided it was time to head back. I retraced my steps, making sure to take photos of the tracks as proof of my encounter. When I returned to town, I shared my story with friends and family. Some were skeptical, while others excitedly shared their own theories and stories about the legendary creature. As for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had come incredibly close to uncovering the truth about Bigfoot. That day in December 2000 marked the beginning of my obsession with the mysterious creature. Since then, I've dedicated my life to searching for evidence and learning all I can about Bigfoot. And though I've never come as close to the creature as I did that day, the memory of those tracks in the hills off Hunter Road continues to fuel my determination to uncover the truth. As I stared at the lifeless body of my best friend, I knew I couldn't let this go on any longer. The once peaceful town we called home had become a place of fear and nightmares. The forest surrounding it now uninhabited by deadly, unknown creatures. We had come together as a group of hunters, determined to protect our town and families from the mysterious predators responsible for the gruesome animal attacks that had plagued our community for months. We had entered the forest, weapons in hand, prepared to face whatever horrors awaited us. But we were not ready for the cunning intelligence and ferocity of the creatures that hunted us. They picked us off one by one, their stealth and speed unmatched by any predator we had ever encountered. I was the last survivor, my friends and fellow hunters now nothing more than memories and fallen comrades. Desperate and terrified, I stumbled deeper into the forest, hoping to find a way to stop these relentless monsters. That's when I discovered it, an ancient relic hidden away in a dark, forgotten cavern. Its mysterious power seemed to resonate with the creatures, hinting at the possibility of controlling them. With newfound determination, I began to study the relic, learning its secrets and unlocking its potential. As I deciphered its ancient symbols and harnessed its power, I devised a plan to turn the creatures against one another, using their own instincts and abilities to defeat them. With a relic in hand, I ventured back into the heart of the forest, seeking out the lair of the predators. When I found them, I used the relic's power to emit high-frequency sound waves, carefully tuned to a frequency that specifically affected their hearing, leaving the other forest animals unharmed. The creatures, disoriented and incapacitated by the sound, began to turn on one another, their pack mentality shattered by the unbearable noise. As the predators fought amongst themselves, I watched from a safe distance, the power of the relic protecting me from their wrath. The once fearsome creatures were now vulnerable and confused, their reign of terror coming to an end. With the last of the creatures defeated, I returned to the town, battered and bruised but alive. I carried with me the relic, a testament to the power it held and the lives it had saved. The nightmare was over and our small town could finally begin to heal from the horror that had gripped it for so long. In the end, the ancient relic and the knowledge of the high-frequency sound waves had been the key to our salvation, allowing me to overcome the deadly predators and protect the home and people I held dear.
I didn't personally witness any of the sightings, but I heard about them from the police reports. Officer Linda Seabrook saw a creature that looked gargoyle, like while driving home from work on the Garden State Parkway around 7.4 p.m. She couldn't believe what she was seeing, but was sure of the dark reddish skin and scaly reptilian wings of the creature. Another police officer, Scott Kimball, had a sighting of a gargoyle-like reptilian on Route 33 near Union at approximately 4.35 a.m. He saw a creature nearly six feet tall with scaly wings protruding from its back. The creature had larger than normal eyes and canine teeth. Officer Kimball saw the creature land briefly on an abandoned building and was able to make out its approximately five-foot-long tail. Police dispatch also received calls about sightings of a gargoyle-like creature in Cherry Hill Township at around 8.43 p.m. Witnesses reported seeing a creature nearly seven feet tall with large bat-like wings behind its shoulders. The wingspan was estimated to be around 13 feet across. There were also reports of strange flying reptilian creatures in Pensacon Township at around 3.17 a.m. Multiple witnesses called the PD to report creatures with red glowing eyes, large wings, and massive black talons. While I haven't seen any of these creatures myself, the reports are certainly intriguing. I've always loved exploring the great outdoors, and one of my favorite pastimes is hiking the trails in the Mount Hood National Forest. The vast expanse of wilderness, filled with towering trees and hidden mysteries, calls to me like a siren song. One crisp autumn day, I set out on a solo hike down Old Cat Road, a trail that meanders through a replanted area of the forest near Colton. As I walked along the path, my senses were filled with the sights, sounds, and smells of the forest. The rustle of leaves beneath my feet, the chirping of birds high above, and the earthy scent of damp soil filled the air. The beauty of the forest never failed to take my breath away. It was then that I stumbled upon something that would change the course of my hike and spark a deep curiosity within me. As I rounded a bend in the trail, I noticed a set of tracks leading out of the replanted area onto the road. The tracks were unlike any I had seen before. Large, deep impressions with distinct claw marks. Curiosity peaked. I decided to follow the tracks to see where they led. They continued along the road for a short distance before disappearing back into the trees. I hesitated for a moment, unsure if I should venture off the trail, but my curiosity won out. I stepped off the path and followed the tracks into the dense forest. The underbrush grew thicker as I pushed deeper into the trees, and the tracks became more challenging to follow. Still, I pressed on, determined to uncover the mystery of these unusual tracks. As I continued my pursuit, the forest seemed to close in around me, the shadows growing darker and more oppressive. Finally, after what felt like hours of searching, I found the source of the tracks. In a small clearing, I came face to face with a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was massive, standing at least eight feet tall, with dark, shaggy fur and piercing, intelligent eyes. I realized with a mixture of awe and terror that I had discovered a cryptid, a creature of legend. The beast regarded me with curiosity as if it were just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. We stood there for a moment, locked in a silent standoff, before the creature turned and disappeared back into the forest, leaving me alone in the clearing. As I made my way back to the trail, my mind raced with questions. What was this creature? How had it managed to remain hidden for so long? And most importantly, what would I do with this incredible discovery? From that day forward, my life was forever changed. The encounter in the forest fueled a lifelong passion for cryptozoology and a quest to unravel the mysteries of the unknown. The memory of that fateful day in the Mount Hood National Forest continues to inspire me as I journey through the world of cryptids, searching for answers and unlocking the secrets of the wild.
It was my best friend's birthday. We pitched tents in the backyard. Six of us went for a walk on the dirt road in the canopy. On the other side of the canopy is the Willamette River. Four of the friends kept walking further up the road. My friend and I sat down to talk in the shade. That's when rocks started to be thrown in the river. We thought our friends were trying to scare us. When we met up with them, they were mad at us because they thought we were trying to scare them by throwing rock in the water. After figuring out it was not any one of us, we were all kind of scared. As kids, we were told of bums and our drug growers on the banks of the Willamette. We were not thinking of Bigfoot at all. We turned and started to walk back to the yard, and there they were. One large Bigfoot standing in front about seven to eight feet tall, and two smaller ones standing behind about six feet tall. They came up from the riverside, stood in front of us, and snorted. Maybe ten seconds felt like forever, and then took off on two feet through the brush opposite from the river. I had never seen something move so fast and so quiet once they hit the brush. My friends ran. I stood frozen in fear. I believe due to shock, I blacked out the experience for a long time. It is one of the most horrible things to go through. Who do you talk to about this stuff? No one believes the story. I have met up with one of the people that was there. He says that he doesn't remember what he saw. He just remembers everyone being really scared and running back to the yard. It's so frustrating. I wish I would have never seen it so that I wouldn't have to believe. Here is one of the creepiest encounters I've ever, which took place in the spring of 2015. It's important to the story to know that I was basically a huge jerk leading up to what happened. See, I'm a graduate student, and I was at this point about six, eight months into a new relationship with a woman named Sarah. If it matters, I'm female, and we were both around 30 at this time. The prior year before I met Sarah, my best bud from school, Josh and I had gone on a great camping road trip over spring break. This year, I messed up and basically double-booked myself to go camping with Josh and with my girlfriend. Because I'm a scatterbrained idiot, and I got confused about what plans had been discussed, solidified. Both Josh and Sarah were justifiably really pissed off and hurt, but I had made the plan with my girlfriend first, ultimately, so I had to flake on Josh. When it came time to planning, Sarah and I picked a campground in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of good hiking. It's at least a five-hour drive from where we live. We made reservations, and I mentioned the plan to Josh. Well, it turns out, of all the campgrounds in the region, Josh had also decided to head to that one as it connected to a long bike trail he wanted to go on. He had decided to go camping alone. So we knew Josh would be at the campground before we got there, but things were super awkward between me and him, on account of my being an asshole and him being generally a bit depressed around that time. We stayed three nights, and Josh was there for the first and second night. We'd rented out a small cabin, basically a prefab shed with bunk beds. Because it was cheap, and we have a lease reactive wimpy, about rain dog, and it's sometimes easier that way, Josh was tent camping in another spot. I think Josh and I were mostly planning on avoiding each other. He was rightfully still angry. Things were awkward, and I figured he needed some space from me, but it turned out only one bathroom was open on our side of the campground since it was only early April and most of the campground was still closed down for the season. Josh's campsite was right next to the open bathroom, so we ended up seeing him when we walked to the bathroom at night. I saw heard signs of one or two other groups on the far side of the campground, but they had their own bathroom open over there, and we never really saw them. It's a very large and forested campground, and only small sections at either end were open for the season. The second night, Josh was out in his campsite when we came through to the bathroom before bed. It was after midnight at this point. Josh seemed super depressed, and we had a very strange and awkward conversation with him. Took care of what we needed to in the bathroom and headed back to our little shed down the road. The roads in this part of the campground were basically like an inverted F with a bathroom above the top of the F. 
In between the two arms of the F was a stand of trees next to the main road, a small lock shower building in Josh's campsite, furthest from the main road, the main road being the vertical line of the F. We were staying off the main road further down on the opposite side, so that night we'd cut past Josh's camp to get to the bathroom, but on the way back, we followed the road so as not to bother him. As he seemed in a bad mood, it was dark and I'm easily spooked. We had the dog with us, which was somewhat reassuring, since he looked semi-tough despite being a nutcase and a wimp. But I'm looking around nervously, and as I glance over my shoulder, I think I see a man off to the side of us. My brain processes this very slowly as I just caught a glimpse of him as I turned my head, and it was very dark. I convinced myself my mind was playing tricks. I didn't look back and silently walked with Sarah and the dog back to our cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I thought Sarah looked a little spooked, which is unusual since she's a lot braver than me. Eventually, she says that guy was really creepy, right? So shit. He was real. I told her I saw him, but had convinced myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no, we both saw someone with no flashlight standing in the trees just off the road, maybe 15 feet from us. I asked if it might have been Josh. Neither of us were really convinced, but wanted to convince ourselves so we could get some sleep. And he had been wandering around being moody 15 minutes before, and it was right by his campsite. I think we didn't want to freak ourselves out any further, so we locked the cabin and didn't talk about it much more. The next morning it was pouring rain, so Josh decided to pack up and leave early instead of spending the day in the area. We shouted goodbye to him as we headed to the bathroom, and he ran around tossing shit in his trunk and trying not to get drenched. That night was a weekend, and there was a big family in the cabin next to ours, and everything felt far less spooky. But when we got back to town a day later, I texted Josh, asking him if he'd been lurking creepily in the wood. He said no. Well, I told him what we'd seen, and he said he'd seen a guy the prior night lurking in the woods without a flashlight. Same general description, which I'll get to. Same area. The guy had really creeped him out, so much so that the next day he bought the biggest maglite he could find, so he'd have more than just a pocket knife to defend himself. But he'd also mostly convinced himself it was a park ranger. Yeah, with no flashlight, let alone a vehicle. But he more or less willed himself to believe it so he could get some sleep. So, once we could no longer pretend it was Josh, Sarah and I compared notes. What we both saw, and what Josh saw the night before, was this. A tall, gaunt white man in his late forties, with clean-shaven, sunken cheeks in the stand of trees bramble just off the road, in the space between the arms of the fit. He was wearing a raincoat, rubber boots, and a hat, and had no flashlight. He was just standing still and staring coldly in our direction. I remember his raincoat, his sunken face, and how very cold his gaze felt. In contrast, Josh is several inches shorter than whoever we saw, was not wearing a raincoat that night, which we knew because we'd just seen him. But we convinced ourselves otherwise, bearded 29 years old at the time. I should add, it wasn't raining. To be clear, where this guy was was not somewhere you'd be strolling through. It, it was a thick, brambly area. He had made the effort to move out of the road and to stay in the shadows and away from the bright bathroom light both nights. We're sure he wasn't going to the bathroom. Though we were on the women's side, you can hear the men's side clearly, and Josh had been outside in view of the bathroom doors both nights. He didn't look like he lived in the woods which is to say he appeared clean and groomed and his clothes weren't worn or dirty. Whatever he may have been doing in the middle of the night in a nearly abandoned campground with no flashlight, he was clearly making an effort not to be seen. We all discussed it and Josh ultimately called the campground to let them know. They said they'd check it out. Although my camping fees were mysteriously refunded, we never heard anything more. Josh is still a little mad at me for seeing a potential murderer lurking the woods near his tent and not doing anything. Out of curiosity, we just checked to see if anything had happened in the park. A number of people have gone missing in the state park over the years, some slightly mysteriously. 
Most were found downriver and believed to have fallen into the rapids on accident. I'm sure it's unrelated, but the whole place gives me the creeps, and I still can't figure out what that man was doing. So last year around November, September, I was driving home late at night, 2 or 3 a.m., from my buddy who lived on the other side of the city with my bike. I was stoned as F when I was leaving. Me and my buddy smoked a lot that evening. I had two routes in my head that time that get me home. One was 13 kilometers long through a forest. The other was a much longer route through the city around the forest. For info, I live in Hanover, Germany. The city is pretty much built around these big forests. I decided to go for the forest route, which was already a bad choice since I didn't have any lights on my mountain bike and the forest is very dark at night. But I've been driving this route often since the other route is just a waste of time. It was an easy decision for me back then since I'm a two meters tall male and was armed with a knife. So I'm rolling into the forest in my root trough. It was this asphalted track for inline skaters and bikers. It goes all the way trough. I'm pulling out my cell phone to activate the camera light since this was my only light source. I had and realized I forgot to charge the phone at my buddy's house. So my phone has this option when it's below 5% battery level. You can only activate the camera light for a few seconds till it turns off automatically and you need to turn it on again. Needless to say, it was quite stressful to drive like that, always the light turning on and off. It rained that night too, but not much. More like foggy, fine rain. I don't know what it's called in English, but we call it in German easel. Because of that, I only could see what was close in front of me, like 10 or 15 meters view only. Three, four kilometers in. The track takes a sharp curve. After I was taking it, I would see a white figure standing next to the road. It was dark as F laid, and I'm literally in the middle of the forest. I was thinking about returning, but I decided in a matter of seconds to keep going, since I had a lot speed on. I was rushing through the forest. When I spotted the figure, I couldn't see much since I was like 20 meter away, but in seconds when I came closer, I could see that it was a man in white jacket just standing there in darkness. Like I said, my phone was keep putting out the light so I would have seen it if he had a light when my phone's light was off. So I'm going full speed towards that creepy guy standing next to the road. I was about five meter now from him and he was just standing there motionless, like not even turning his head. Light goes out, four meter now, three, two, I put the light back on and bypass him. I see him in the face. He was the most unhygienic looking man I've ever seen. Full nasty beard like a homeless guy just staring at the track. It was this moment I would feel a heavy rumble under my tires. I almost crashed. The track where the man stood was full off sticks and branches, like a barricade. I think my mountain bike tires were saving my ass that day. Needless to say, I have bike lights now and don't take that route at night anymore. I believe that a lot of people get signs before something really bad is going to happen. Two nights ago, I woke up screaming from a very lucid, horrible dream, where in the woods outside my house I heard someone in pain calling for help. I go to them and find a naked humanoid deer creature that turned on me. I believe that thing was a skinwalker. Then last night around 3 a.m. I heard and felt what sounded like something very large hitting the side of my house. Very clearly I could tell it was happening in the area outside of my kitchen and either next to or below my kitchen window. I was in my living room sitting on the couch where there is even a wall between the living room and kitchen. But this sound was so loud it could be heard throughout the whole house. And while I was already awake, the sound scared my cats. Also woke up my sleeping daughter and partner. I could feel the wall behind me and the floor vibrate, along with the dishes and kitchen cupboards rattling around from the impact. This happened at least twice, I'm certain. 
maybe once more. But after the second time, I was so scared, I ran to check on my family. There was about a ten-second pause between the sounds. After the dream I had, I haven't been able to sleep in fear. Plus, the loud noises are keeping me up, too. Made sure to lock everything just in case. I'm wondering if the events are connected at all. If anyone can give me tips or help ease my mind, I'd appreciate it. The other day I was driving home, and as I came around a curve, there was an animal that I thought was a goat at first. It ran away from me and got far enough away that I couldn't see it in my headlights. And it ran across the road and hid behind a bush. It was smart enough to pivot around the bush as I drove by it. It was extremely pale and looked like a camel shape. It moved like a Chinese dragon and looked like it was made out of a bed sheet. If y'all have any questions, please ask. I'm seriously trying to figure out what I saw, natural or supernatural. Don't know if this helps, but I'm from North Carolina, and this all happened next to a cow pasture. Wasn't a cow because they only have brown cows, no white ones. And I grew up around cows. They don't move, look like that. It was probably about four to five feet tall and about six or feet long. It was a pretty big animal. I am a female, 22. I am petite, really pale, and always messy hair. I was wearing loosened clothes, all whites. Maybe you will guess where I'm heading to. I was outside smoking while sitting on a chair in my front yard. I forgot to mention an essential detail. I live in the countryside. My street leads to fields and forests. The night here hits differently, if you know what I mean. The sky offers some great masterpieces freely to our starry eyes. So yes, I was just hyper-focusing on the sky. I just stood up and decided to take a picture. I wanted to reproduce it through painting. However, I was really disappointed by my lame camera. So I decided to head out inside to grab one of my parents' phones since their quality were better. While I was trying to take some pics, I felt a gaze on me. It was my new neighbor. She was staring at me. I was in my front garden just in front of her house. I was waiting since in my front yard there is an automatic light. It flashes at any movement and lasts for like 20 seconds. Important element. So I was only visible for a few moments. It was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live. So I was relieved to feel invisible. As I was finally taking mesmerized pictures, out of the blue, the flash of the phone I was holding started to light up. The moon was right on the left side of her house. Yeah, it looked like I was taking photos of her house. I heard her screaming. I put my hand on the flashlight, turned it off. I was petrified. I didn't know which option was the best. Ah, fleeing right away in my house, so reactivated the flash. Looking suspicious, B confronted her, also talking to her for the first time, and explaining the whole situation because I scared her quite often. I will explain after the other option. C, just disappearing in the dark and waiting. Okay, so I am a night owl and I love art. It is not unusual to see me outside, standing right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway past midnight taking pictures, smoking or just contemplating. So I spooked her multiple times. I know because she said that I was the weird neighbor to someone. One day I was playing in the front yard, playing with my cat with a red light laser, obviously late at night. I accidentally lighted my laser towards one of her windows, so a flashy red light point was visible. I heard her screaming, lighted up the room. I turned it off and I glanced at her. She was looking at me and shut the curtains. Back to the story, I decided to not move and wait. Then I was like I should still continue taking pics. I heard loud voices. The front door opened. I heard them walking slowly towards their car and whispering, what was I supposed to do? I just took a last pick and headed to my house. As the flash went on, I was petting my cat. I heard her saying again, this weird chick. As soon as I closed the door, I laughed out loud. Nervous reaction. Surely I should find a way to talk to her. 
reassuring her that I'm inoffensive or just remaining the weird neighbor. All right, so this takes place a little over a year ago in the north woods of Wisconsin in winter. My parents had been out of town for probably about a week, and I was dog-sitting. I was in a big old house alone, which I didn't mind too much. I couldn't drive, but I'd take long, cold winter walks through the woods a few miles to get to the grocery store. I say this to point out that I knew the place pretty well and definitely wasn't scared of the area. On one of the last days they'd be gone, I heard a strong, distinct whistle. It was at the same tempo of the sound a fog horn would make, but very high pitch. It was pretty loud and sounded incredibly close. I looked out the window and saw nothing and no one. I also heard about nothing, no footsteps, birds, deer, or anything else. The silence was so eerie that I could feel my heart pounding, I immediately ran to shut and lock all of the doors and windows. I stayed up about half of the night with a most unsettling feeling. I just couldn't shake like when you know that something's watching you. I also want to mention that my closest neighbors were completely out of town, and I saw no footsteps the next morning except my own. I grew up in Hillsboro just down the road, and there was something that haunted me during those years. A tall, featureless figure darker than the darkest night. It appeared in my room on multiple occasions, always in a different position. Sometimes it would be crouched down in the corner, facing the wall, while other times it would lurk inside my closet, staring into its depths. These encounters left me feeling unsettled and frightened. One particular night, shortly before I was about to leave for college, the figure took on a more terrifying form. As I awoke from my sleep, I saw it bent over at a perfect 90-degree angle, its face positioned directly above mine. It started repeating the same phrase over and over again, in a haunting voice. I am here. I am here. The words echoed through the room, sending shivers down my spine. That night marked the last time I ever saw the figure. As I left for college, I hoped to leave behind the unsettling experiences of my childhood. However, the memory of that encounter remains deeply ingrained in my mind. It's both fascinating and unsettling to hear someone from the same area recounting a similar experience. To this day, I find myself reflecting on those encounters and wondering about the true nature of that mysterious figure. What was it? What did it want? The questions remain unanswered, and the memory of those eerie encounters continues to leave an indelible mark on my consciousness. It's a reminder that there are inexplicable forces in this world that we may never fully understand. I was born and raised and currently live in the very rural north woods of Wisconsin, near the U.P. border of Michigan on land that was originally, and still somewhat sparsely, populated by the Ojibwe people. I had a similar experience this past February, 2023, that I can't shake. I was solo snowshoeing an isolated trail system in the Chekomagon, Nicolette National Forest in the Lake Superior Snow Belt, not far from my home. It's a beautifully remote place that I've explored many times alone, often never crossing paths with another person. This time it was sunny late afternoon. I was again alone on a particularly scenic trail paralleling a small, fast-flowing river, which was open and only iced over on the banks, enjoying the serene scene accompanied by the sweet songs of chickadees and industrious sounds of nuthatches amplified by the cold calm. As I got further on the trail, I noticed it suddenly got very quiet, which wasn't alarming at first as the winter woods can get very silent especially considering our high snowfall amounts that blanket the land. Then, out of nowhere, I heard a rhythmic, deep and reedy sound of a low but loud whistle through the brittle woods. I was captivated as I had never heard that sound before. It had a powerful pulse to it that I can't really describe. I am an avid birder, admittedly not an expert, 
but I was baffled. The noise was somewhat close when I first noticed it, but instead of being curious, I became concerned as I heard the sound getting closer to me. The sound inexplicably filled me with dread. It seemed to be traveling quickly, maybe as fast as a bounding deer, and seemed physically low, the utterance coming from somewhere just above the ground and well below the treetops. While I was out there, I rationalized that the strange vocalization must be from a raven. Ravens are year-round residents up north, so I am very familiar with them. They are highly intelligent birds with complex individualized calls that include deep sounds like croaks. However, I have never, ever, in my four decades of living up here, have ever heard a raven utter a sound like that noise. That day I was deep in the woods and was the first person breaking trail after a big snow, so I couldn't move fast. I decided that my best course of action was to just keep going until I got to a switchback that would shorten my journey. As I paralleled the river from a ridge above dents with new pine growth, I heard the sound from what seemed to be between me and the river, maybe fifty yards maximum. I stopped and listened as it moved on and beyond, still paralleling the river. I couldn't see much ahead of me, and I did not hear any footfall of it breaking the snow. Honestly, as irrational as I felt, I was grateful to be hidden. I hauled it to the trailhead and got out of there as fast as I could. As soon as I got home, I started researching and seeking out any information on what bird or animal could have created that vocalization. Nothing I found matched that sound. To this day, I just tell myself it must have been a raven, but I know in my own small understanding of the world that it was something else. The Alaskan wilderness has a way of swallowing you whole, embracing you in its icy grip and challenging your very existence. It's a place where only the strongest survive, where solitude becomes your closest companion. I am Jack Turner, a rugged individualist who has carved out a life of seclusion in a rustic cabin nestled deep within this unforgiving landscape. My days are defined by the rhythm of self-sufficiency. Chopping wood becomes a meditation, each swing of the axe a reminder of my resilience. Hunting provides sustenance a reminder that I am a part of this wild world, and the tranquility that only isolation can offer becomes my solace, my refuge from a world that seems to grow more chaotic with each passing day. As the days grow shorter and the winter months stretch on, the snow-covered landscape closes in around me. The howling wind becomes a haunting symphony, and the dance of snowflakes outside my window is both mesmerizing and isolating. I find comfort in the routine and the simple acts that tether me to reality. But one evening, as the wind's howl grew louder and the snowflakes danced with newfound intensity, something shifted. I peered through the frosty window of my cabin and caught a glimpse of movement among the trees. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of my imagination, an illusion conjured by the isolation and the long hours spent in the quiet wilderness. Yet as the day has passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Glimpses of the same dark, hulking shape appeared on the periphery of my vision, always just out of reach. It was a presence that seemed to defy explanation, a feeling that crawled beneath my skin and nestled in the pit of my stomach. I hesitated to share my experiences with the outside world, who would believe me a lone man, living in the heart of the wilderness but I couldn't ignore the unsettling truth any longer. I began journaling my encounters, documenting every detail, every chilling observation. My descriptions painted a vivid picture, a towering figure covered in matted fur, eyes that gleamed with an otherworldly intelligence, and a presence that sent shivers down my spine. As the creature's appearances grew more frequent, my skepticism wavered. My rational mind clashed with the inexplicable reality I was facing. The isolation that had once brought me solace now deepened my uncertainty. I questioned the very foundation of my reality, grappling with the idea that there was more to this world than met the eye. Desperation drove me to seek answers in the stories of native Alaskan legends. 
Tales of similar creatures that inhabited the wilds echoed in the back of my mind, offering a sliver of validation for the inexplicable horrors I had witnessed. A turning point came during a stormy night when the wind howled like a banshee in the snow, swirled in a frenzy. With a heart pounding in my chest, I mustered the courage to confront the creature that had haunted my every waking moment. Armed with a flashlight and a camera, I ventured into the blizzard, determined to capture evidence of the elusive being that had invaded my world. And there, at the edge of the clearing, my flashlight's beam illuminated an imposing figure. Its features were obscured by the swirling snow, yet I felt its presence reverberate through my very being. In those fleeting moments, as I snapped photos in the blinding storm, I knew that what I had witnessed defied all logic. In the aftermath, I shared my story with a trusted friend and a researcher who treated my experiences with raw honesty. Despite my initial hesitation, I knew I had to speak my truth. With conviction, I declared, Bigfoot is real, and I wouldn't lie about it. My account ignited a blend of fascination and skepticism among those who heard my tale, blurring the line between reality and the unexplainable. As I look out at the snow-covered expanse that surrounds my cabin, I am reminded that some mysteries are destined to remain hidden in the heart of the wilderness. The world may doubt my story, but I carry with me the knowledge that I have stared into the abyss and witnessed something that transcends understanding. The Alaskan wilderness is a place of wonder and terror, a realm where the line between reality and myth blurs, and the truth is as elusive as the creatures that roam its depths. Growing up, I remember my father telling me stories about his days as a logger. He was a strong, hard-working man, and he loved his job. But there was one story he would tell that always left me with a sense of unease, a story about a strange encounter he had in the woods. It was late autumn, and the logging season was coming to a close. My father and his crew were working hard to finish up their last few jobs before the winter snows arrived. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, my father decided to head back to camp early to prepare dinner for the crew. As he drove along the winding forest road, he suddenly spotted a large, hairy man dart out of the woods and across the road just a few feet in front of his truck. My father slammed on the brakes, his heart racing in his chest as he tried to make sense of what he had just seen. The creature was massive, covered in thick, matted hair, and running on two legs like a human but with a speed and agility that seemed almost unnatural. As quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the woods on the other side of the road. My father sat in his truck, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly as he tried to process what he had just witnessed. He knew he couldn't keep this to himself, so he drove back to the logging site and told his fellow lumberjacks what had happened. To his surprise, many of them believed his story. They had heard whispers of strange creatures living in the woods. Creatures that were not quite human, but not quite animal either. Together they decided to form a search party and see if they could find any trace of the creature my father had encountered. Armed with flashlights and a sense of determination, they set off into the woods, following the path the creature had taken as it crossed the road. They searched for hours, their flashlights casting eerie shadows among the trees, but they found no sign of the creature. As the night wore on and the temperature dropped, they eventually decided to abandon their search and return to camp. My father couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there, watching them from the shadows, but he knew there was little they could do to find it. The story of my father's encounter with the strange, hairy man spread throughout the logging community, and while some dismissed it as a tall tale or a trick of the light, others believed it to be true. My father never saw the creature again, but the memory of that night stayed with him for the rest of his life. As I grew older, I found myself wondering about the mysterious creature that had crossed my father's path all those years ago. Was it a figment of his imagination, or could it have been something more? I suppose I'll never know the truth, but the story remains a haunting reminder of the mysteries that still lurk within the depths of the forest.
My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent 10,000 hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building Fort's BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail mule deer, wild boar, etc. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side. But this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts. But this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both mid-twenties-ish, and it was 2019, and this was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few county roads, which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically middle of nowhere. Nearest main road is probably eight, ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We then spent the next day scouting tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked then ate, had some beers, and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.35 ish a.m. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds, different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment, I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, it felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped. It started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent, our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things were drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. Just seems odd it was still of the middle of the night, and we were so far removed from any nearby community's industry to hear and experience this occurrence. I, 27 female live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains, round shapes covered in forest, not high. So just behind my home, lots of hikes start. I always lived here and I like mountains. Plus I'm getting in shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So last summer I was walking my usual route when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset and took a rock. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances, typically of U.S. I imagine. Picture the average small town of 2,500 people. Starting from bottom in a two-hour hike, you're on top of the mountain. And the route I took was about 30 minutes to arrive halfway the mountain to a big Christian cross and a nice view. 
I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, a nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and started making our way up, nice and relaxed, but active as we didn't have too much light time left. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. No chances of getting lost. Woods immediately engulf us. Pretty dense, but it's the norm. Not even 15 minutes of walking and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls up just thinking about it. Even my dog stops, anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. I've read the gift of fear. And the only time I didn't listen to my guts, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, if you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind, too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back on the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home for the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I haven't gone back. When I was growing up, we lived near a town called Welty in Oklahoma. It's really not much of a town, just a tiny store, some churches, and a lot of farms. We lived off the main road, close to an area called Macabre, which is also nothing but farms and a cemetery, and not even considered a town. Very middle of nowhere. My family told a lot of creepy stories about this place, especially having to do with orbs and weird deer. I do have memories of seeing orbs floating over the trees and have no idea what those were, but I never personally saw anything else. My dad has always been a skeptic and never chimed in on these stories. He has Alzheimer's and has a great memory of the past, but horrible short term. The other day he was telling me how much he loved living out there and wished he could still live there, and I brought up the orbs and the creepy stories my family always shared. He agreed that they were always creeped out out there, but then he told me he actually saw something really odd once. He told me one night he was sitting on the porch by himself, and a man ran through our yard wearing what looked like a deer head. Not just the antlers, but like he had a deer's head. He just ran through and continued on down the pitch black road. My dad didn't know what to think of it. He just told me he thought people out there had too much time on their hands. My mom and brother also saw what they said was a deer walking upright all the way down the road. I know deer do this, but they said it, it just kept walking like that in the middle of the road. My aunt also said they passed a man who was wearing a deer's head on the road one night. There aren't street lights in this area, so he was just out there in the dark road alone, just standing there. It was late November 1994, and my husband and I decided to go hiking to Bagby Hot Springs in Oregon. The weather was chilly, and a thick layer of snow covered the ground. We were both excited to get away from the city and immerse ourselves in the tranquility of nature. As we hiked along the well-trodden trail, I noticed something peculiar, barefoot tracks in the deep snow. The tracks were quite large, about 14, 16 inches long and 6, 8 inches wide at the ball. What struck me as odd was the absence of any claw marks and the fact that the smaller toes seemed almost non-existent. The stride was long and the tracks followed a generally straight line up the trail, although they occasionally crossed back over, as if the creature had doubled back. I decided not to mention the tracks to my husband, who was a skeptic when it came to anything out of the ordinary. Surprisingly, he didn't bring them up either. We continued our hike, but my curiosity about the tracks only grew stronger. As we neared the hot springs, we encountered a park ranger named Jake. I couldn't help but ask him if he had seen or heard anything unusual in the area. He was a tall, sturdy man with a weathered face that suggested he had spent years working in the wilderness. 
Jake looked at me thoughtfully for a moment before replying. You know, I've heard some stories from other hikers about strange tracks in the snow. I've seen them myself a few times. Some folks think it's a prank, while others believe it might be something more mysterious, like a Bigfoot. My husband chuckled at the mention of Bigfoot, but Jake didn't seem to find it amusing. Look, I can't say for sure what's making those tracks, but I'd advise you both to be careful out here, he warned. The wilderness can be unpredictable, and it's best to stay alert. We thanked Jake for his advice and continued on our way to the hot springs. The rest of our hike was uneventful, but the memory of those tracks lingered in my mind. It was early morning in September as I walked through the dense forest, about a quarter mile off Wildcat Mountain Road. I was on a mission to track the movement of an elk herd that returned to this area every seven days to feed. The sun had just begun to peek through the trees, casting a golden glow on the forest floor. I had been hiking for a while when I met a seasoned hunter named Joe. He was also tracking the elk and had been doing so for years. We decided to team up and continue our observation together. As we moved deeper into the woods, Joe shared fascinating stories about his experiences as a hunter and his encounters with various wildlife. Suddenly, from the next canyon over, we heard a high-pitched whistle that pierced the stillness of the morning air. The sound was incredibly loud and lasted for about twenty seconds. Joe, being very familiar with the sounds of the forest, was puzzled by this whistle. He assured me that it was neither an elk nor a cat. The peculiar whistle set off a frenzy of barking from dogs at nearby homes, which continued for about five minutes. Joe and I exchanged worried glances before deciding to cautiously investigate the source of the strange sound. As we approached the next canyon, we stumbled upon something we never expected to see. A large, hairy creature standing on two legs, its eyes fixed on us. We were both frozen in shock, unable to move or speak. The creature appeared to be a Sasquatch a legendary being that had been the subject of countless tales and rumors, but never proven to exist. The Sasquatch seemed just as surprised to see us, and it let out another high-pitched whistle before disappearing into the dense forest. Joe and I stared at each other in disbelief, our hearts pounding in our chests. We knew that we had just witnessed something extraordinary, something that would change the way we viewed the world and the creatures that inhabited it. The encounter with the Sasquatch overshadowed our original mission to observe the elk herd, and we spent the rest of the day discussing our experience and pondering the existence of this mysterious creature. As we parted ways, Joe and I agreed to keep our encounter a secret, knowing that most people would dismiss our story as a fabrication or an exaggeration. But deep in our hearts, we knew the truth. We had come face to face with a legend, a creature that had eluded mankind for centuries. And although our encounter was brief, it would remain etched in our memories for the rest of our lives. On August 1st, 1987, I, Officer Torgan responded to a call about a possible drunk driver. When I arrived at the scene, a white male in his early 20s took off running. The incident occurred around 1 a.m. along Highway 44 near Ellington, Missouri. I requested backup and began searching the area, but I couldn't find any footprints or tire tracks that the suspect might have left behind. I remember thinking, this is one of the strangest things I've ever put in a report. I returned to my patrol vehicle when suddenly I heard a high-pitched humming sound. To my shock, a large humanoid creature with an extremely fit and strong build stood before me. Its eyes were a deep, piercing black, resembling the pupil, less appearance of a shark. The creature's arms hung down, giving it an ape-like look while its head was humanoid in shape. The nose was pushed flat against its face with a heavy brow, perhaps from a fall during its lifetime. Its wide mouth was filled with numerous tiny, razor-sharp teeth. Long strands of stringy hair hung from the back of its head, reaching midway down its back. I observed that the creature seemed to have been living in the woods as its skin was dirty, matted, and gray. 
It stood about eight feet tall and had very wide shoulders, maybe twice the width of a human's. I was so frightened by the sight that I didn't even think to pursue it. Instead, I simply got back into my patrol car, returned to the station, and filled out a report which I never intended to release, at least publicly. I described the creature as one of the strangest things I've ever put in a report. When it stood before me, it looked like something right out of a horror movie. I know for certain that I saw something very unusual on the night of July 26 while driving home from work. I hadn't been drinking and was completely sober. I also don't drink caffeine or take any type of stimulant or depressant drugs. When my wife saw the tracks, she initially thought they were left by a bear, but we later learned there were no bears in the area. In our front yard, we have a large maple tree with low-hanging branches. The creature I saw at the window was definitely not a bear. It stood on two legs, very unlike how a bear stands, and reached with its arms as if to touch me. It was only about five feet away from the window when we made full eye contact. The experience was terrifying. I don't know for sure what I saw, and my wife is just as certain that she saw it too. I've never seen any type of creature resembling that thing before in my life, and I hope to never see one again. Clearly, I'm not alone in this experience, as others like Officer Torgan have shared similar stories. There are things out there that defy the world we live in. Maybe shows like X-Files and Twilight Zone had it right. Back in the mid-90s, I had a close friend named John who shared my passion for hiking and camping. One weekend, John and his wife, Emily, decided to hike to Indian Prairie Lake to camp and fish for a couple of days. I was unable to join them due to a prior engagement, but they promised to share their adventure with me upon their return. When they came back, their faces were pale and their hands trembled as they recounted their experience. They told me that the area around the lake had been unusually quiet and still, and they couldn't shake the eerie feeling of being watched. As John waded into the lake to cast his fishing line, their normally aggressive dog, Bear, followed him, whining and trying to wrap himself around John's legs. They felt so spooked that they decided to leave after only a short time. A few weeks later, their high school aged son, Jake, and his friends decided to camp at the same lake. They, too, experienced the same sense of unease, and once again, Bear freaked out, this time retreating to the safety of their tent and refusing to come out. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, the boys were determined to stay the night. As darkness fell, they were harassed by something that screamed in the night. They also heard the sound of something being thrown at them. Terrified, they broke camp and left in the wee hours of the morning. I couldn't help but feel intrigued and concerned about the strange occurrences at Indian Prairie Lake. As a former Navy SEAL, my friend Randy was always up for a challenge, so I told him about the mysterious happenings and asked if he wanted to investigate with me. Without hesitation, he agreed. We arrived at the lake determined to uncover the truth behind the unsettling events. The air was heavy with silence, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We set up camp and waited, Bear lying nervously at our feet. As night fell, we took turns keeping watch. It wasn't long before we heard the same blood-curdling scream that John's son and his friends had described. Randy and I grabbed our flashlights and ventured out into the darkness, Bear reluctantly following behind. We searched the area but found no signs of what could have produced the scream. However, as we returned to our campsite, we noticed large, unusual footprints near the edge of the lake. They were unlike anything we had ever seen. We continued our investigation the following day, discovering more footprints and what appeared to be evidence of something large moving through the underbrush. As a Navy SEAL, Randy was skilled in tracking, and he was baffled by what he saw. Despite our best efforts, we were unable to determine the source of the strange happenings at Indian Prairie Lake. To this day, the mystery remains unsolved. Years later, I heard that Jake had joined the Marines and was stationed in the Middle East. I often wonder if he still thinks about that eerie night at Indian Prairie Lake and the unknown force that had driven him in and his friends away in fear.
I've been a ranger for well over 30 years. At some point, they decided that they would take some of the workload off my feet and let me do most of my work at the visitor center, which is about a third of the way into the natural reserve. My body appreciates their consideration for the condition that I'm in, but my mental health doesn't. Keeping on the move and always on patrol was my way of coping with things. Working out of the visitor center gave me more time to think. And that's not necessarily a healthy thing. Suffice to say, I'm divorced and my kids, well, they don't want to talk to me, all while I'm facing my twilight years all by myself. I'm not trying to draw attention here. Those will be necessary details in just a few short seconds. They forced me to take coffee breaks if I had to go too hard for too long. I was taking one such compulsory coffee break on one of the outdoor wooden park benches completely by my self. People don't come to the park to look around the visitor center anymore. Besides the brochures of park information, the only thing the park has to offer is the same four or five fun facts, and they've been hanging out for a long time. In fact, everybody has seen them. Nobody wants to see them again. I was quickly yanked out of my thoughts when I heard a voice that I hadn't heard for over 15 years, but recognized it instantly. It was the voice of my ex-wife, and she was calling my name. My brain was trying to come up with a rational explanation as to why I was hearing this. And then I heard my daughter's voice come out to me also. Except she didn't sound like the 43-year-old woman that she had grown into. Instead, she sounded exactly the way she did when she was around nine years old. I was anchored to the park bench for a while, terrified to move. Just in case I was having a heart attack or a stroke or experiencing something else that would mess with my mind, Perhaps I was dying. Perhaps this was a practical joke. But who could mimic those voices so well and know my name at the same time? I decided to try a more tactical approach. I would come towards the voices, but I wouldn't answer them. There were long pauses between each call as if my wife and daughter were waiting for me to answer. But then they would call out again. And it was in those moments that I would pick up on the direction that they were coming from. Unless my ears were lying to me, it sounded like they were coming from the woods that came right up against the physical building of the visitor center. I stepped to the trees quietly, resting when there was silence and walking when I heard the voices. I approached the opening in the trees. They couldn't have been more than 14 feet in diameter. It was also clustered by some low-growing shrubs. I remained hidden as best as possible. It didn't sound like the voices were coming from nearby. They were coming from that very small clearing. I didn't see how it could be possible. If my wife and daughter were there, they'd be visible clearly, unless they were lying down on the shrubbery. So I stared for what felt like forever. But then, a shape slowly rose out of the growth, and it appeared to have two large block eyes that were proportionate to its head the same way the eyes of a fly are proportionate to its head. Everything about it was just a little too long. The neck, the shoulders, the arms. It did not stand up to its full length, just high enough to get a good look around before opening its mouth and speaking with both the voices of my wife and my daughter in one, calling out to me, asking where I was and what was taking so long. Then, without noticing me, it slowly sank back down. I could see its pale ribbed back bent over and underneath the topmost of the leaves where it did its best to try and stay hidden. I took up my pistol and I shot as many times as I could before I realized that there was a problem. At least two good hits landed on its flesh before it sprang up and ran. I don't know if the other three or four shots hit. Miraculously, I was able to slip back into the center and not have to offer an explanation to anybody important. The older girl there, that works behind the front desk, asked if she had heard something dangerous, and I just told her that I saw some kids setting off fireworks. My ex-wife may be many things, but somebody with the ability, let alone the intelligence, to send some strange forced monster after me and lure me out with the sound of her voice isn't one of them. After that incident, I've kind of given in to the urging of my superiors to spend more time in that area and less time tromping around outside. 
There are clearly more forces at work in this world that know more about me and know me better than I know myself, and the less I have to tangle with them, the better. I apologize in advance for my story being so long, but I figured I would give you the unfiltered version. Thank you. It was 2008 in San Antonio, Texas. I was on patrol alone one night when I heard a loud thumping sound coming from the back of my squad car. I stopped, got out to investigate, and then suddenly I was faced with something that seemed to come straight out of a horror film. I was terrified and shaken, and this is my story. The district I was patrolling was new to me. It was around 2.20 a.m., and I had just finished checking several convenience stores when the loud thumping sound from the back of my car caused me to pull over. As I stepped out of the vehicle, a large figure burst out from the woods across the street and started running towards me. For a split second, I thought it was a person, but as it got closer, I realized with a chill that it wasn't. The creature was on all fours, covered in hair, with the body of a man and the head of a wolf. It seemed to be wearing a uniform, but as I squinted through the darkness, I realized it was just its thick, matted fur. The creature stopped about thirty feet from me, its eyes boring into mine as though sizing me up. Fear rooted me to the spot. I slammed on my car horn for what seemed like an eternity, hoping someone would come, but no one did. Suddenly the creature started to charge at me. Oh, coming my initial shock, I jumped back into my car and sped off. I was too frightened to share my encounter with anyone. I was afraid they wouldn't believe me, that they would think I was crazy. But now, as similar sightings are being reported all over the world, I've decided it's time to share my experience. I hope that my story encourages other officers who have had similar encounters to come forward In the summer of 94, I found myself in the heart of Oregon's mountainous region. I was working for a geological service back then and had taken a friend along for a horseback ride near Husband Lake, close to Linton Meadow. We were about seven miles out on the Cascade Crest Trail, a rugged path accessible from where Road 1624 ended. The trail was flanked by a swampy area on one side and a steep 400-foot cliff on the other, coming off Husband Mountain. As we were riding along, something strange at the top of the ridge caught our eyes. There was a stump there, or at least that's what we initially thought it to be. But then, to our disbelief, the stump moved. It stood up there and watched us, I remember saying to my friend in hushed whispers. The figure was at an almost impossible angle, precariously leaning over the cliff edge, seemingly trying to get a better look at us. Then, almost as if it was aware that we were watching, it started to retreat in slow motion, gradually disappearing from our sight. However, this wasn't the last we saw of it. Twice more, it reappeared along the trail. One time, it had its foot rested on a boulder. That was when our horses began to act up sidestepping and dancing nervously. They were clearly spooked, and we were in a hurry to get down the trail, away from the mysterious figure. The creature was silhouetted against the sky, the sun casting its form in shadow. We couldn't see any specific details, but its size was unmistakable. It was a massive figure, easily twice the size of a man, and appeared to be heavily muscled. Its fur or skin was dark brown. It resembled descriptions I have heard of the fabled dogman. After that encounter, I became convinced that there was a family of these creatures in the area. I don't know if they are dogmen or Bigfoot or something else entirely, but I do know that they are out there. And every time I venture into those mountains, I can't shake the feeling that we are being watched by those curious hidden eyes It was the 14th of October, and my son, Peter, and I found ourselves hunting in the woods northeast of Lincoln City, Oregon. The air was crisp, and the rustle of autumn leaves echoed through the forest, creating an eerie yet familiar atmosphere. We've always enjoyed these father-son excursions, a tradition passed down through generations. 
But that day we were to stumble upon something that would etch itself into our memories forever. As we moved deeper into the woods, we noticed a peculiar sight. A large section of the forest floor had been disturbed. Numerous roots, each one large and white as though freshly exposed to the air, were pulled up from the ground. That wasn't the strange part. What baffled us was the arrangement of these roots. Each one of them was laid in a row along the path we were following, all facing the same direction. The roots were intact, displaying a systematic arrangement that seemed too deliberate to be the work of animals. It was as if something or someone had carefully uprooted and arranged these roots with a specific intent. Peter and I exchanged puzzled glances, our curiosity peaked. We were familiar with the woods and its residents, but this was something we had never seen before. It was unsettling, and we felt a sense of unease creeping over us. Nevertheless, we decided to press on, keeping a mental note of the strange roots. The next day, we returned to the same spot, half expecting the roots to be gone, perhaps carried off by some animal or scattered by the wind. But they were still there, undisturbed laid out in the same meticulous order as the day before. To this day, we don't know what caused this strange occurrence. Was it some bizarre, natural phenomenon? Or was it the work of an unknown creature in the woods? We can only speculate. But one thing is certain. The woods of Lincoln City hold mysteries that go beyond our comprehension. And that day, we had come face to face with one of them. This just happened last night. My boyfriend, our husky, and I embarked upon our long holiday road trip to see our families earlier today. Fourteen hours of this trip takes place on a major U.S. interstate highway. We were looking for places to make our last gas stop and found a place just off the highway. We pulled off and into the desolate gas station and immediately were greeted by a fairly large, somewhat sketchy man, taking not-so-subtle glances in our direction. We both were joking that maybe we chose the wrong gas station. And boy, did we. My boyfriend suggested that while he pumped the gas and run to the restroom, I'd take our dog and let him stretch his legs. Being a city girl, I know to always carry my mace and phone, especially at night. We diverged as I started to make my way towards the ill-lit side of the gas station and my boyfriend to the restroom. I made it not thirty feet from my car and was approached by a small Chihuahua mutt with a collar who happily greeted our husky. I looked around for an owner while the two dogs got to know one another and continued to walk to a patch of grass with our new follower in tow. My first instinct was to help the dog and find his owner. But in the back of my mind, something felt very off, and to be honest, it felt off since the moment we pulled in. I immediately called my boyfriend and told him I had found a dog and said, Hey, I found a dog, but something is weird. He immediately abandoned his bathroom break and came out to meet me. While I'm standing with our dog and this dog who came seemingly out of nowhere, I felt eyes on me from the employees working outside. My boyfriend expressed concern about the dog being loose so close to a major highway and further looked around for its possible owner. He approached one of the employees who was changing out trash liners right next to our car for some time now. He asked the employee if he had any idea whose dog this was. In perfect English, he replied, I don't speak English and anxiously turned around to only continue to go through the motions of changing out a trash liner he had been standing at this whole time. He then continued to watch his chase around this dog until a dog led us behind the conscience store gas station. With my boyfriend five feet behind me, I followed the dog to the back of the store. Behind the store, ten or so big rig trucks sat largely in darkness resting for the night. Cardboard boxes and broken wood pallets covered the dirt. A large man in a gas station uniform greeted me staring through a glass door. With my boyfriend out of view, I bent down to check the dog's tag as the man continued to stare. My boyfriend approached, and that's when the man behind the glass door's demeanor changed. Almost dejectedly, he opened the glass door. I quickly asked, Do you know whose dog this is? Nervously, he fumbled his words and replied, 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that's my bad dog. We both exhaled and exchanged a look as if to say something about that was really weird. We made our way back to the car, and my boyfriend remembered he had to still use the bathroom, so I settled back into our locked car. When my boyfriend got back to the car, he told me the same man we talked to at the back of the store, followed him to the bathroom, and stood behind him watching. That's when we realized just how creepy and surreal the last 15 minutes had been. As we drove away, we discussed the strange and creepy series of events how the whole thing felt staged or set up. Why did the employee act like he didn't know the dog when it belonged to his co-worker? We immediately googled the small town we had stopped in and discovered it has been a hot spot for human trafficking. In recent months, 60 people were arrested. Was this just a string of eerie coincidences, or was there some more sinister going on here? It was an early Tuesday morning. My friend and I were bow hunting off the face of the rock quarry. We stopped to rest on a bench in the tall timber where we sat facing up the hill. We had come down from earlier in the morning. We couldn't rest because we kept hearing a rustling sound up the hillside that kept our attention. Shortly thereafter, we thought we heard what sounded like girls talking on the 1160. One rode directly above us. It first sounded like laughing that immediately turned into a blood-curdling sound that went to a soft laughter, to a very high pitch that got louder and louder. My first thought was it sounded like a mother watching its young being killed. This sound got so loud in its direction, now sounded like from multiple directions around us, like something was joining in on the cry. By this time, approximately 20 seconds has gone by, and the sound has not stopped for one second, not even to take a breath of air. My friend kept asking me, what is it, as I was staring up the hillside in amazement. He finally was so scared, he grabbed my shirt and looked me in the eye and said, what is it? I replied, I don't know, but it better not come after us. This sound started to wind down like an old World War II hand crank warning alarm and then dissipated into a soft sound, then to nothing. We estimated this sound carried for approximately 40 seconds, and like I said, it never stopped to take a breath. The northwestern part of Pennsylvania, particularly the areas surrounding the Allegheny National Forest, has a rich history of reports about UFOs, Bigfoot, and other inexplicable events. It was in this intriguing setting on July 8, 2017, that my partner and I had an encounter that left us both bewildered. That morning at around nine, I stepped out onto our deck, which overlooks the lush greenery of our country home, nestled near the forest. What caught my eye was an unusually large moth resting on a six-by-six vertical post. The moth, if I could even call it that, was approximately 11 inches long and about five inches wide at what I can only describe as the shoulders. Its shape was peculiar, somewhat reminiscent of an hourglass. Adding to its unusual appearance were two appendages at the top of its head, antennas or pointed ears, perhaps, each about an inch long. It seemed as though the creature's head was tucked into its body, as if it was resting. Based on its size, I guessed its wingspan would reach an impressive 15 inches when fully spread out. Intrigued, I called my husband to witness this peculiar sight. I was taken aback by the creature's strange beauty. Its wings shimmered with a pale green iridescence, while the middle part appeared to have a creamy skin-like texture. My husband was equally amazed, expressing that he'd never seen anything like it before. We both agreed that it resembled a giant moth. We spent some time observing the seemingly slumbering creature. Eventually, I gathered the courage to touch it, finding its wings smooth, almost skin-like, but not feathery or fuzzy. The creature remained still, not reacting to my touch. I also noticed a lack of the powdery residue typically left behind after touching a moth's wings. Before we had to leave our home for a bit, I decided to fetch my camera to capture a picture of our unusual visitor. 
Standing about a foot away, I tried to power up my camera, but to no avail. Despite the camera having never given us trouble before, and even after replacing the batteries, it still refused to turn on. The next day, it worked perfectly fine again. On our way to the car, we spotted another similar creature perched on the outer wall of our home about ten feet off the ground. When we returned home later, both creatures had vanished. We've since made a sketch of what we saw. It shows the back of the creature's wings, and the red area behind it represents the six-by-six six vertical post it was resting on. It's possibly just a coincidence that my camera malfunctioned when I tried to photograph this odd winged creature. However, I've heard of cases where photographic equipment mysteriously fails when someone attempts to capture images of UFOs or other phenomena. More recently, similar incidents have been reported in connection with significant UFO encounters in our state. Other researchers involved in paranormal investigations have reported similar experiences as well. This happened ages ago when I was 20. One, I was a manager for a big box store, but in a town that was an hour drive from me. I lived in a small town, and the store was in another small town, both about 12,000 people each. But in order to promote the manager, I had to transfer, which meant doing this drive daily. I had hoped it would be temporary because I dreaded driving this every day, especially late at night because of deer, etc. This was also before cell phones were really the norm. I did have one, but it was one of those ancient bag-style phones, and I had just got it a week or two before. With these phones, you had to plug them into your car lighter in order to have them work, and they had a corded attached handset. Anyway, one night I was driving home, and it was really late, about 1 a.m. The drive is pretty desolate with houses sporadically throughout mixed with sections of wooded areas. About 20 minutes before my town is a random casino in the middle of BFE. I had just passed this casino and a truck pulled out behind me. I didn't think anything of it, but it was noticeable pretty quickly that they had been drinking because of their erratic driving. Because of this, I just figured. I just put as much room between us as possible. Also to note, as I was going past them, they had their headlights on, of course, and could have easily seen I was a young girl by myself. So the truck comes up behind me at a pretty fast rate of speed and goes to pass me. As they are next to me, they swerve a little towards me, and I just think they are much more drunk than I thought, and slowed down so they could easily pass. As soon as they got in front of me, though, they started to slow down, way down. It got to the point that we were going 20 miles per hour in a 55 miles per hour zone and still slowing down like they were trying to stop me. Every time they would get to around 5 miles per hour, I would swerve to the opposite lane and give it some gas like I was going to pass, which would then make them temporarily speed up. I could also see a lot better in the truck at this point. It was an extended cab truck with what appeared to be five or six guys in it. This was during hunting season, so it wasn't out of the norm to see groups of guys acting ridiculous and drunk this time of year. So they were trying to stop me, and I didn't want to necessarily pass given what had just happened, but at a certain point I had to. So I go to try and pass the truck, but it blocks me from doing so by getting in the middle of both lanes. I try this a couple of times with the same results. Then finally I try to floor it and pass in the truck, but it tries to run me off the road. I immediately get back behind them, and I'm freaking out at this point. I had tried calling 911 but there was a huge area with no coverage yet, and I couldn't get through. After what seemed like forever, I finally get through to them, and they send someone out immediately. As I'm on the phone with them, I see car lights in my rear view, and am filled with panic because I know this car will inevitably try to pass, given we are only going about 30 at this point. Sure as shit, the car comes up behind us and goes to pass. And sure as shit, the truck actually runs them off the road and into the ditch. I'm telling the 911 dispatcher this, and in a full-blown panic. We're getting close to town now, though, and I can see the first stoplight. 
I wasn't sure what the truck was going to do because our one lane splits into two and there are gas stations, etc. up ahead. Right as we approach the first light, I see an officer come in the opposite direction and I start flashing them over and over while telling the dispatcher that I see the officer. The officer makes a U-turn and gets in between me and the truck. He flicks the lights on them to pull them over and they pull into a gas station at the main intersection of our town. I follow into the gas station to assist the police in whatever statements they may need and want to make sure these assholes are actually arrested. That didn't end up being a problem because they refused a breathalyzer, so they were taken to the hospital where a blood alcohol level was obtained. I really wanted to know more, but the officer didn't elaborate. I kind of wish I would have called up and followed up on it. They never called me or anything to do anything in court, so I'm guessing they didn't need me, but it also means that they got away with only getting a DUI. I didn't realize this wasn't okay until way later much too late to have done anything about it. All I know is the officer said they were all three sheets to the wind. God only knows what their intent was, but I was terrified to find out, and thank God for that damn bag cell phone. It could have saved my life. My ex-wife and I saw in plain sight a female cross the road in front of our car. We had to stop very quickly or we would hit her. This happened at around 9.30 p.m. We went back there the next morning and found where two, three had been standing, watching traffic to cross the road. From 2000 through 2004, I heard many different calls from my bedroom from various times. The oddest at 9.30 a.m., this was the loudest call I had heard, and it sounded like it was lost or looking for a younger one that was lost. I have never heard a creature with such a lung capacity. The volume was incredible, and that was in broad daylight about half mile from my home. It woke me up immediately, and I knew right away what it was. I have excellent audio tape recordings that I recorded as I heard them through a magnified microphone. Many times I had walked in the woods by the house, and I felt the presence of them around me. I also found many footprints in the largest pile of feces that I had ever seen, and my dog was very leery of that. My wife and I had planned a peaceful getaway to a cabin in a rural town nestled in the mountains. It was a much-needed break from our busy lives, and we were excited to enjoy the serenity of nature. It was around 8 p.m. when we heard an air raid siren, which we assumed was related to a fire. The sound pierced the quiet evening, and it rang out for quite some time. We initially joked about it being the beginning of a zombie apocalypse, but as time passed, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. We didn't know what the siren was for, and... Our curiosity got the better of us. Deciding it was best to find out what was going on, I put on my coat and boots before venturing out into the chilly night. I walked down the road to a small grocery store nearby, hoping someone there might know the reason for the siren. As I entered the store, the warm air and bright lights provided a welcome contrast to the cold darkness outside. I approached the counter and asked the store clerk if they knew what the siren was for. To my surprise, they looked at me with a puzzled expression and replied, What siren? I couldn't believe that they hadn't heard it. I stepped back outside, expecting to hear the siren again, but it had stopped. The eerie silence that had returned was unsettling. I made my way back to the cabin, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Upon my return, I shared the strange encounter with my wife. We were both left with a lingering sense of unease, but we tried to brush it off and enjoy the rest of our stay. However, we couldn't help but wonder about that mysterious siren and why nobody else seemed to have heard it. The mystery of that night would stay with us, long after we left the mountain. A few years back, I had this really creepy experience with an older co-worker of mine that still kind of shakes me to this day. It happened at this place that I'd been working at for a couple of years at that point. 
The place was a small factory of sorts, with only less than a handful of employees, including myself. One day, though, my boss introduced us to this new, older guy that he'd brought in to start working in the other, newer side of the factory. You see, the factory where he worked had two different sides to it. One side for beeswax and one side for wood production. My boss had brought him in because they went to church together and the wood production on the other side had a religious significance. The new older co-worker worked there with us for about one month before he approached me one day and introduced himself to me. He seemed like a nice guy and even came back to give me a Hershey kiss. Not long after that. A couple months later, I got asked by our boss if I could go pick up my new, older co-worker, probably because his car was broken down or something. I agreed to it, so my boss asked me if it was okay to give the co-worker my phone number so that we could coordinate via text. I said it was fine and went on my way. I brought him back to the factory with no problems. Soon after that, though, I started to get random and sporadic texts from him late at night. At first, the texts were just about us, maybe hanging out soon, while simultaneously apologizing to me because he knew he was much older than I. But then the texts started to get pretty pervy, and they would be as long as a mini-book. The texts were just long, misspelled, random, pervy compilations. I tried to just ignore the texts, but that only made them start coming more frequently. In the midst of all this one day, my roommates were scrounging for a ride to a casino only a few miles from our house. I gave them a few dollars for a ride, and they said that they'd find their own ride back. So imagine my surprise when they returned only a couple hours later with their own ride, all right. Their ride was my creepy co-worker. Not only was I creeped the hell out that this pervy jerk now knew where I lived, but I also didn't know how he came to give my roommates that ride. Was it just sheer coincidence or something more? A few days after that, I went to visit a friend at his apartment that was located on our main street running through our small, historic downtown area. When I came downstairs from his apartment as he was located on the second floor, I made my usual turn, walking on the sidewalk in front of all the main street shops. As I walked past one of the shops that was maybe two doors down from my friend's apartment, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but it couldn't be. Could it? To my great dismay, it was him, my creepy-ass older co-worker standing in the doorway of one of the shops and smiling creepily at me from under a black top hat. A couple of weeks after that little incident, I noticed him again as I left my friend's apartment. He was just standing on the sidewalk with that same creepy grin plastered on his gaunt face. Since I had already informed my friend after the last incident, I simply texted him real quick to let him know the creep was back. I got into my car and left after sending the text, so I didn't find out until later that the creepy co-worker was gone by the time my friend got downstairs to the sidewalk. At that point, though, the texts were still coming even faster than before. He was even threatening to come by my house if I didn't respond. Long, provocative texts dictating what he'd like to have happen between us if he did just happen to show up at my house. When I would see him during the day at work, though, he would act as though everything were normal, giving no hint of his nighttime persona. After seeing him yet again as I left my friend's apartment, I just so happened to overhear a couple co-workers of mine standing around discussing how weird our new older co-worker was. Right then I stepped in and joined the convo, finally showing one of my other co-workers the text messages that the creep had been sending me. I had been working with that particular co-worker for a few years, but I didn't know him too well. He was one of those people who came off kind of grumpy and distant. Still, I told him and my other co-worker not to say anything. They both nodded in agreement, and we went our separate ways to finish up for the day. When I came into work the next day, though, my boss immediately called me into his office. My boss told me that he'd been informed of the situation and the texts, and he wanted to see my phone to read them. I told my boss that I didn't really want to get anyone in trouble, but he said that was besides the point and that my situation needed to be addressed. 
My boss also stated that my older co-worker had no right or reason to be texting me and talking to me the way he was talking to me. The boss must have had a pretty good talk with him because all the crap stopped from the older co-worker after that. The other grumpy co-worker of mine apologized to me for saying something to the boss, but I completely understood and I was actually pretty grateful to him for that. I should have been the one to take the initiative to talk to the boss about it, but I was just too chicken. Fortunately, though, that situation seemed to work out for all involved, because life went on as usual, and everyone involved acted as though nothing had ever happened. Well, I can't really say that, because that situation actually caused the grumpy co-worker and I to talk more, and we started dating. We were together for about three years, and then we got married... I was in Cozumel, Mexico, driving a truck through a completely uninhabited area on my way to a beautiful secluded beach. The sun was shining, and I was eager to relax on the pristine sand, soak up some rays, and enjoy the crystal clear water. As I continued down the deserted road, I suddenly spotted something up ahead. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. This strange creature looked like a stick figure drawing with a disproportionately large head and a spindly body. It was all black and stood on its hind legs, seemingly aware of my presence. Without any warning, the bizarre creature darted across the road right in front of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, barely managing to avoid hitting it. My heart was pounding, and I stared in disbelief as it disappeared into the dense jungle. Shaken by the encounter, I continued on my way to the beach, but I couldn't get the image of that creepy thing out of my mind. When I met up with my friends, I told them about what I had seen and even drew a sketch of the creature. They were just as baffled as I was, unable to identify it based on my description or drawings. Over the years, I've tried to find out what that strange creature could have been. I've researched every known animal that inhabits Cozumel, but nothing seems to match the stick figure, like being I saw that day. Even my friends who still live on the island haven't been able to figure out what it was. To this day, the memory of that eerie encounter lingers in my mind. I can't help but wonder what it was that crossed my path in the uninhabited wilderness of Cozumel. Perhaps it was a creature yet to be discovered by science. Or maybe it was something supernatural. Whatever it was, it remains an unsolved mystery that continues to haunt me. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.